I would like to bring this meeting of the school committee to order and ask all of you to join with me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. I'm getting good practice with that. As our viewers can tell, we're starting the evening early tonight uh, so we can have an executive session uh, for the purposes of uh, contract, a uh, collective bargaining negotiations. So in a moment, I'll be asking for a motion from the committee to go into executive session for the purposes stated. At the end of executive session, we will come back out into open session and we will conduct our regular uh, meeting. So may I have a motion, Ms. Burgess? I move that we go out of an executive session for the purposes of collective bargaining. And it's seconded by uh, Ms. Tricelli. Are there any questions on the motion? Except the one that I'm going to ask. How are we voting? Are we voting orally or are we voting through this machine? Uh, orally. Yes. Orally. So your vote to go in? Yes. Yes. Michelle. Yes. Bob. Yes. Tim. Chair votes yes. 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 The school committee has voted to go into executive session. Uh, afterwards, we'll be back out and conduct our regular business. Okay, I'm bringing us back into session. Uh, we started our meeting early tonight to do an executive session, so I apologize for the few minutes of delay. Uh, so we're now back to our open agenda. And before I take general comments from uh, the community members, we do have a guest here tonight, uh, uh, President, Director? What chair stations? of oh, Division chair. Three. Chair of Division Three, the Massachusetts School Committee's uh, Jason. Frazier, you want to come down, Jason, please? Welcome. I made you president. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Probably no not pressure. a good thing to do with this, to this <laughs> day. You've changed. Uh, first of all, um, Mr. Chair, thank you very much for letting me come before the committee this evening. Uh, to the administration and staff and other committee members, thank you for your time. I know how busy it can be being here tonight. Um, I really wanted to come to publicly thank Kim, your vice chair, for stepping up recently to join me as uh, division leadership for the southeast of Massachusetts on the Mass Association of School Committees. Um, Kim has agreed to join me as the vice chair of Division Three. As many of you know, MASC is really a service organization. We provide professional development for school committees all over the Commonwealth. Um, but it will be my job and Kim's job to make sure that we're meeting the needs of the particular school committees here on the South Shore. Um, we were very thankful last year um, to have Plymouth Public Schools host a division meeting where we talked about school resource officers. And we have another division meeting coming up next week on March 6th. Um, it's gonna be at the Boston Tavern in West Bridgewater. Um, dinner is on MASC if you'd like to join us. And we're gonna be talking about Chapter 70 funding and the gaps between where our current formula is of foundation and what the Foundation Review, Foundation Budget Review Commission um, really has asked us to do um, moving on four years ago um, and how we can address the inadequacies of, of the budget coming from the State House. Um, in addition to that, I'll also be meeting with Commissioner Riley on the 19th up at UMass Amherst and um, then bringing some of that information back to uh, the day on the Hill on May 1st up at the State House. And you're all invited uh, to come up and join me on May 1st at the State House for the day on the Hill. Um, but thank you for your time and I just wanted to thank Kim in front of our home school committee and um, I appreciate everything that the Plymouth Public Schools has done to support MASC and its mission on the South Shore. Well, well uh, Jason, I can say that uh, you have a busy schedule as well and we're honored that you came here this evening and we're equally honored for, for Kim's uh, being your vice chair. Uh, that'll be a, gr a good connection for us as well. So we're, that's really very good for all of us. Kim. And just thank you very much. And thank you for asking me to, to join you. And I'm honored and I'm looking forward to, um, to helping the, the region do the best that we can and help everybody out. So thank you. Absolutely. Thank, thank you for your time, Mr. Chair. Appreciate thank it. You. Thanks. It's so different. See you next week. <laughs> is there anybody else attending tonight's meeting who isn't already on the agenda who would like to address the school committee? Okay. Seeing no hands, uh, I'm going to move to uh, Plymouth North High School representative, please. So we have MCAS testing coming up which will be held on Tuesday, March 26th through Thursday, March 27th. And then the makeup date will be the Friday, March 28th. Um, third term is just started. Um, on March 1st, marks are the halfway point for the third term. 
We encourage students and families to keep checking Aspen and to keep up to date for their child's academic standings. And with any questions, please call the guidance office or to your child's teachers directly. We also have Spring Meet the Coaches Night. Um, parents, guardians, and student athletes must attend our Spring Meet the Coaches Night on Tuesday, March 5th at 6 p.m. in the Performing Arts Center. The spring sports season opens on Monday, March 18th. For student council, we will be hosting the No Winter Last Forever Craft Fair, which is on Saturday, March 2nd, from 10 a.m. to 2 p.m. And please join us with over 98 crafters here at Plymouth North High School. And March Madness will start on March 11th. And it's a big fundraiser for our um, school community. And we will have a lot of activities all week, such as kickball, dodgeball, and volleyball. Um, we also have a VPA musical production. So the Plymouth North production of 9 to 5 will be Friday, March 16th at 7 p.m. And then there will be another showing at Saturday, March 17th at 7 p.m. And tickets are available at pnhs-drama.com. Or you can see or email Mr. Grossman for more information. We also have um, an American Red Cross blood drive coming up through the National Honor Society. And it's our annual spring um, blood drive. And the drive will take place Friday, March 8th in the gym. Um, the NICE scholarship is also a coming up, which is a $3,000 renewable scholarship that is now available in guidance. The application is due in guidance on or before Monday, April 11th at Oh, I'm sorry, April 1st at 2 p.m. And no, late applications will not be accepted. Seniors may also access the applications through their Naviots account under scholarships. And seniors are also encouraged to apply for any other available scholarships around. And please check your Naviots for private scholarships, which your guidance counselors can upload. And scholarships are constantly being added. And lastly, um, the Honors Breakfast is coming up for students on Thursday, March 7th, and we want to congratulate all of our students who have received that honor. All right, thank you. And now, South. The PSHS Theater Guild's performance of Sarah Rule's Eurydice was truly a masterpiece. It's no wonder why we're recently awarded excellence in acting, ensemble performance, and technical e execution. Congrats, cast, crew, and directors on an outstanding job. The annual Freshman Academy Strategies for Success Breakfast took place on February 15th. Thank you to your central office administration for attending. Students that have been identified as struggling academically in the first semester were invited. Their parents had the opportunity to meet with the Freshman Academy teachers and hear about strategies that can be used to help them succeed. This has proven to be a positive event to get these students back on track. We have more hardware to add to the trophy case. Congratulations to the South Wrestling team as they won the Division II South sectional runner-up. Also, congratulations to our winner percussion as I took first place at the Dartmouth competition this past weekend. How about Biomed? The medical intervention students visited Beth Israel Deaconess Plymouth to learn about careers and equipment used in the emergency room. What a great experience for our students. A reminder to seniors that caps and gowns must be ordered online no later than March 6th. Spring sports signups will take place Wednesday during K Block. Student athletes will be encouraged to sign up for Family ID prior to the meeting, the Meet the Coaches Night, that will take place on March 7th. College, career, and technical education acceptance letter go out to the to the this Friday to both PNHS and PSHS. Once again, a tremendous application pool for exploratory at South and the four programs at North. Thank thank you to Ed Jacobs and Kelly Makomer from PYDC for an amazing presentation for our staff on educating the traumatized child. Ed presented at the last in-service choice session and the feedback was extremely positive. Save the date. The term two honors breakfast is March 12th and March 13th. Guest speakers and student recognition begins at 8 a.m. On both days there'll be breakfast with pastries and refreshments afterwards. Join us this Thursday for the staff versus students basketball game. Come to see the varsity girls and boys teams take the, st the staff. Admission is $5 and all proceeds will benefit the freshman class. Also, we have a winter instrumental course. Oh, wait, this is just not from. All right, that's it. <laughs> <coughs> Excellent reporting. Thank you so much to both of you. <coughs> Before uh, we move on to school improvement plans and updates, 
Is there any, uh, Dr. May, is there anybody here on the field trips that we could take out of turn yet to save them from having to wait? Nobody's here yet? Not yet. Oh, well, we tried. Yes. Okay. Uh, he emailed me earlier and I told him to call you at 730. Okay. Thank you. Uh -huh. <laughs> Dr. Mayes' school improvement plans. Yes, tonight uh, we have the Federal Furnace Elementary School Improvement Plan and School Council. They're here to present, and I'd like to welcome their team, um, and that will be led by Principal Dan Harold. Uh, Principal Harold is uh, here to provide some oh, updates to the school improvement plan. So we have to get a couple of, one more chair actually, <laughs> and just want to welcome you all to uh, Plymouth School Committee. Mr. Harold, I guess you're going to kick this off, right? <laughs> Good evening. Welcome. Thanks for coming. <laughs> Uh, thank you for the opportunity. Um, I'd like to start by introducing uh, the members of the team. Um, a couple aren't here tonight. I'll, uh, the two that are, aren't able to attend, um, we have uh, Mr. Chad um, Argensinger and um, Andrea Holmes, both parent representatives who could not attend. Um, on the end, we have um, Stephanie Wells, who's a teacher rep. Um, we also have um, Amy Tenberg, who's parent rep, Nicole Burke, kindergarten teacher, teacher rep, and then um, Brendan Brady, who is a parent rep, and also doing some work at Indian, I mean, at Federal Furnace. Yeah. Sorry for the slip. It's gonna, <laughs> it's been a while. It's been 15 years of presenting Indian Brook, so there you go. this is a little strange. <laughs> um, we're gonna kind of present it in a tag team. Um, various members are going to introduce different pieces of it. I just kind of felt um, to, kind of preface a little bit of this plan. I know traditionally we present um, a summary of the um, previous plan uh, prior to looking at the new plan. Um, I know all of you are full well of uh, my transition over to um, um, Federal Furnace um, um, earlier this year. Um, I still remember sitting down having numerous meetings and at one of the meetings I just was thinking of this uh, Ms. Fry and I were sitting down because I was going to be a mentor, but little did I know that I would be the mentor and the mentee um, <laughs> at Federal Furnace at the time. Um, central office was, um, we had a number of meetings, we discussed uh, concerns and so forth, um, and it really is the premise um, for this plan as we present it going forward. Um, and as such, where I came in, in August, I really felt it was f far more important to look at the future than the past, so I'll be very honest, I did not do much with the previous um, school improvement plan, but rather really looked at developing um, the future of Federal Furnace moving forward and shaping this plan that's before you now, so um, kind of the structure of it. Um, I know there's two things, the PowerPoint, which is, it's PowerPoint. Can we switch yeah. that over, Kristen, <laughs> to the blue? So, uh, rather than <clears throat> the first yeah. one. There, there you go. So there we go. Um, Thank you. As I did the members, okay. All right. So um, Ms. Tenberg is going to piggyback on this. Um, the first thing that we really did, um, myself, Ms. Deucer, and um, with the phenomenal support of the teaching staff at Federal Furnace is we kind of really started brand new, like a, we we're opening a new building. Um, and we started by looking at our um, mission statement and our core values at Federal Furnace moving forward. And we developed our new um, PBIS, our positive behavior intervention system um, around those items. And that's the first component that is in um, both the school improvement plan and this slide here. And it really is the, the core to the school. It's what we live by, it's our mantra. It's, it's what we expect from the kids, we expect from everyone. Um, and we've created a phenomenal um, reward system for the students. No different than, you know, we get rewarded, if you think about it in a paycheck, we reward them for their accomplishments. Um, and we just actually already had what, we had a building earn, <laughs> I know Ms. Burke, they've had grade level earn, she can share some of those experiences, but it's been great. It has really created a very positive um, support system in the school. And I know Ms. Timber, I know, why don't you? <laughs> sure. Um, I think, well, before I say anything else, I think I can speak for certainly the parents on the committee and probably the parents in the school um, saying that, that 
the whole sort of starting fresh and you know not not focusing so much on the past but on the future is definitely something that I think we're all on board with um, and in coming up with the core values what I hope as a parent is that it can um, reflect the the student body in a lot of different ways both um, the social and behavioral stuff and, and eventually the academic stuff I think we all discussed that um, that core system is what's going to what everybody is going to build upon um, students teachers staff and and parents as well so these core values as you can see uh, so they spell out roar which is pretty good since our mascot is a dragon um, <laughs> which we made sure to let Dan know is named Fred <laughs> um, so they would begin with respect for self and others and you can see that there's some itemized lists underneath that include listening using expected tone of voice etc ownership um, again taking some some ownership of the things that you do the choices you make the school that you create uh, accountable meaning you know telling the truth staying on task doing the things that you know you should be doing both as a student and everyone else in the building um, and responsible obviously um, you know owning up to the choices that that you make and uh, behaving and socializing and doing your academics in, in a way that um, would be considered responsible and our hope is that between giving the entire school this core basis and um, kind of rewarding the the efforts and having a lot of feedback that encourages them to keep going that not only will it start with um, a comfortable school a safe school a fun school a happy school but also that it will reflect in the academics that come down the line that it will reflect in um, everything from behaviors and things like that and Mr. Harold has been really helpful in um, getting a lot of community involvement projects going a lot more things for the kids to do that they can stand up and be a part of and be proud of um, we've done paint night we've we're starting drama um, and I know for myself and I'm sure Brendan can say to the the kids are really excited they are looking forward to some of the new opportunities they are excited about some of the changes um, they were thrilled to earn a week with no homework <laughs> um, and I think that that so far um, the, the big the big idea that we um, that we verbalized last time was the idea of a culture change and that I think is is what we have started to build and I think are starting to achieve is a culture change and I'm looking forward to how it how it plays out in a really positive way um, so after we set this in place we really had to take a look at our school improvement plan what is and should be our focus and as I said I did have numerous conversations with central office well before landing at federal furnace and uh, I I'm not going to overwhelm anyone with data um, this one slide which I know you have I kind of I think speaks volumes <clears throat> as to why we're focusing on what we're focusing on throughout our school improvement plan over the next three years and it's not to say we're not doing other things but it does have to be our primary focus and that's academics um, we are a school that's targeted for needs of improvement right now um, we've put a quite a few things in place the staff has been phenomenal rallying the changes that we put in place and the ones we're moving forward with um, but I think this slide really speaks volumes as to why we're doing what we're doing um, you know and again I my last slide I even mentioned some of the things we're going to do it's not as if we're not going to continue school safety is not going to disappear it's still there it's just not in the limelight as far as one of our items on our school improvement plan goals that's all um, and as I said so we really think that you know our primary focus is at the end of the day is our goal is to educate children and so you know the other things are wonderful and they do create culture they create create climate they create all those positive things you're looking for but at the end of the day we still need to make sure that they're successful in life and to do that we need to educate them so that's the primary focus okay so we basically have four goals and the first three are all connected to the academics literally all the academics teaching and learning creating that professional culture to support that learning 
how do you implement um, the education that we're trying to provide the students so that they're successful? And then the fourth goal, um, which is the parent communication, which um, I have to say our uh, collective school council was really um, big on that we really needed to increase the communication in a variety of ways, which um, Ms. Brady can talk about later. So the first goal I'm, I'm pretty much going to talk about, which is just really, you know, I, I know a lot of people love to say, well, we're looking at teaching to a test. We're not teaching to a test, we're teaching the standards. If you teach the standards, kids will be successful on a test because they know the information, they know the material. So what we're looking at is increasing um, the three primary target areas because across the board, we did not even come close to meeting target. We actually decreased in many of our areas. So we need to reverse that trend and then do as much as we can to provide um, the students what they should be getting. Um, so our three target areas are clearly ELA, which is to, to in the student growth percentile or of the aggregate. And I hate to look at one group. I mean, we could look at subgroups, low income, we could look at special needs, we can look at all the different, but collectively the school did not perform well. So we're looking at everyone because everyone needs to improve and get the supports necessary to be successful. So that's why we're just looking at the entire student body um, so that we can improve uh, in ELA um, and reduce um, the percentage uh, or increase student growth percentile um, in all areas for students and high needs, disabilities, aggregate, everything. Same thing in mathematics and then in science as well. Um, so the plan is really to how do we do this and what do we do and that's so the focus in goal one is to look at those academic core subjects and then the follow-up in goals two and three are to look at how we we implement those pieces okay so <clears throat> goal two is develop um, and provide professional development at all levels of planning instruction and data um, using a line for the curriculum framework so I'm gonna segue to Miss Burt do you want to is that one working? <laughs> Sorry. Thank you for uh, letting me speak. Um, I am a newer teacher, but I am excited about the opportunities for professional development and is Plymouth as a whole, the opportunities that you guys provide are enormous and you can choose from a variety of things. And the staff this year has really gotten behind Dan and we're working really hard and trying to figure out ways to strengthen and reach the students better. Um, we're trying to push ourselves and try new things and go into different, <clears throat> excuse me, different areas that we've never done before. We're really working hard and collaborating together and eager to get more collaboration time to be able to work with our grade levels and be able to create new things for our science curriculum and be able to communicate and share resources with each other to start boosting the science in the lower grades because I'm only a kindergarten teacher but we're always pushing science and social studies and then I feel like at the older grades sometimes it focuses so much on the the math and science the math and writing and in, ELA that it's nice for us to be able to have a chance to collaborate with each other and kind of create units and work on that. Um, we're trying as hard as we can to make sure we're getting all of our students to where they need to be and I love being able to suggest ideas for professional development, things that we might be interested in as, as a staff and things like that that might help our students no matter where they are to get up to the level that they need to be to be successful. That's it. <clears throat> Ms. Wells is going to speak on goal three, looking at uh, the implementation practices. So, um, so for um, goal three, we've we've really already started working on this implementation, um, and district wide, the differentiated um, workshop model is something that we've been working on. I'm sure you're aware of for some time now, especially in ELA, and um, more recently in the past few years with mathematics as well. And I think what's really great about that form of instruction is that it really allows for us to differentiate um, instruction for our students. Um, we have benchmarking tools that we can use for ELA to determine students' um, actual reading levels so that we can meet them and design instruction um, for them based on where they are and where they need to be. And I know Mr. Harold has really been instrumental in, in um, 
pushing to get a similar benchmarking tool for mathematics as well, and I believe that that's something that we're going to be getting soon. Um, and I think what's really exciting about what's going on at Federal Furnace, and um, Nicole kind of touched on it, is this collaborative approach um, with the staff so that, um, that we're using to support teachers. Um, I know I attended recently all the um, grade level uh, meetings um, as in the instructional technology coach in the building. I want to make sure that I'm aware of what's going on at all the grade levels so I can do my part to support teachers. And at every single grade level, the most important question that I got out of it was, how's it going? How's it going for you as teachers? How, where are your students? Are your students where you thought they'd be at this point in the year? And then taking that question and genuinely wanting um, honest answers, and then once hearing those answers, then saying, well, what can we do to support that? Between um, um, consulting teachers of literacy that were present at the meetings, we have our math coaches, our um, literacy coaches, um, and I think that that's what's really exciting is there's this really collaborative approach so that um, it's almost like that workshop model is being translated into what we're doing for professional development too. We're also looking at where are we as educators and what supports do we need to help our students get to where they need to be. And I think with that approach I'm really optimistic that I think we're going to be able to get our students to where they need to be. Um, <clears throat> that, as I stated earlier, uh, goal four is really looking at parent communication, um, and this was one that I'm looking forward to as we move forward, um, more so into next year because we're going to put some things in place, so I'm going to. Mr. Brady. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, parent communication is all about making sure that parents are part of the educational team, and if you want that to be the case, parents need to be in the loop. And in, in speaking, I've actually only got first and second graders, so I, haven't, I don't have quite the track record at Federal Furnace, but in speaking with other parents, uh, it's apparent that there's been some confusion and not necessar necessarily clarity over the years. So what Dan and Ms. Wells, their initiatives have been to <coughs> standardize that through the newsletter, take it at the classroom level, at the grade level, at the school-wide level, make it standard and normal, and also help parents to understand what's expected. So maybe a parent wants to look ahead what's coming in years to come. So just to have a consistent message all across the school and around the classrooms. And communication is really key. Uh, <laughs> anybody who has kids knows you don't really get information from your children. So it really comes down <laughs> to what you're getting from your teachers and what you're getting from your administrators. And, and to get that information is really important. And also looking at, I think, Dan's Literacy Night is infamous in town, so we're really excited to have that in, uh, in Federal Furnace, have that kind of opportunities come to us in Federal Furnace and expand upon that as well. So not just Literacy Nights, but have Science Nights and have Math Nights. So have parents come in and do an egg drop with their kids or have them come in and play with base 10 blocks. So parents stop saying, I don't get how math is, math is taught these days. Mm -hmm. Really just to try to get parents. And Federal Furnace has a really good parent community. I mean, if you've ever come to any of the social nights that the PTA has done, even the bingo night a couple of weeks ago, it was a full house in the cafeteria and the haunted hallways in the fall. So let's expand upon the fact that Federal Furnace parents want to be in the school and incorporate them into how kids are learning. Make parents part of the experiential learning process as well and not just outsiders looking in and trying to help teachers and administrators be a part of the educational process with the kids. And as I said, I mean, even though our focus is strongly on the academics through this plan, um, these are some of the things and there are a lot that we're doing. So it, the outside of this formal plan, but they're definitely going to be happening just as if they were incorporated in the plan. It's just not as formalized in this. I mean, we've already turned it into a fully inclusive uh, building. Um, you know, as I said earlier, we've revived PBIS and the kids have bought into it and are enjoying it. And, uh, you know, we can see it in the climate. We can see it in their uh, desire to um, be successful um, in the classroom, in the school. Um, we've already started after school programs again at the school, um, as mentioned. We have drama and a few others that we've started. Uh, we're looking at cultural um, curricular nights. Um, we will be having um, a literacy day, at, yes, 
competition for Indian Brook this year. Uh. <laughs> um, and we are looking at our playground, upgrading it, and then just a lot more down the road as we continue to um, delve into the school itself and what the parents are looking for and the community wants. Is there any questions? Committee members, Ms. Badger. I don't have a question, I just have a comment. This morning I, I was, I read to Mr. Gurley's class, and so I just wanted to thank you for the invitation to, to read. We learned about my sloths. Um, but I could, just from being in there, feel like the change in the culture that you guys are talking about. So it, it was really just a great experience. And um, I, I wrote something down, and I can't read what I wrote. But um, I did want to mention, what, oh, shoot. I lost it. But anyway, <laughs> good presentation, and it was really fun at, to read to Mr. Gurley's <laughs> class. <Thank> you. <laughs> Badger, when it comes back, let yeah. us know. <laughs> I wrote, it doesn't make any sense. <laughs> I'll come back to you. Um, just a lot of positive buzz. I have some close friends that have children at Federal Furnace, and I do, you know, see the excitement for the new culture and the changes in the school, and I'm just looking forward to the next uh, presentation where these thoughts become things and some of the positive movement you have so job well done I look forward to the next and while we have the opportunity I just want to take a minute as a parent to thank Mr. Harold for being uh, willing to step up to the plate because um, we've got some pretty fantastic kids at that school and I'm, I'm looking forward to seeing them shine even more um, I think I think that we're headed in the right direction so thank you Miss yes, <laughs> Badger we had a little question answer kind of who like that was explaining what school committee does to them so they would understand and we did talk about your playground so they're very excited about a new playground <laughs> <laughs> that is what I, I wrote down outside I'm not really sure what. <laughs> just I just want to say a couple of things very very good report I, I particularly like the focus on the academic improvement very important mm -hmm. I'm glad to see you all focused on that at all levels that's really good I think that we all of the all of the, the improvement of behavior and culture and respect is so critically important because where else where else are our kids going to learn that you know they're supposed to learn it at home and maybe they do but it's really important to see it out in the field you know I had a uh, true story not in this school district not even close here but I had a 10 year old in my office today and we were in conversation and he said I have a new friend I said oh well, that's really good and he said he told me the, the boy's name and I said how how did how is it that he's your new friend and he said to me, well, everybody picks on him. And then he said, even the teachers don't talk to him nicely. Mm. And that sort of really broke my heart that this 10-year-old is picking up not only the peers, but the adults are not speaking. So I really enjoyed reading what it said right here, use expected tone and volume of voice. And it's a really important thing to teach. And, but then I have a question. Under, under response, under, uh, Responsibility. I gotta get my glasses on too. Well, you don't have to. <laughs> <laughs> Under responsibilities. All of, all of the things you listed were universal, such as, you know, make good choices, use responsible behavior, blah, blah, blah. But then you put in stay in your assigned area. <laughs> I love it. Lane. I love it, but it, it's, it's, so, it's so behavioral. Did promote yeah. that across the town. <laughs> <laughs> how, did, how did that get in there? It, it was a T. We literally, I, 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 honestly, I don't know how this came about as quickly as it did. Last year, literally at Indian Brook, we decided to revamp ours. We spent all of last year, and they put it into place this year. Um, when Ms. Deucer and I entered the building, we started conversing with the teachers, asking, what are you using for PBIS? And the response really wasn't, there wasn't anything viable. So literally with the teachers, and we got together, and we literally did this in about four weeks. <laughs> I think by the end of October, so we just, I mean, just powered it out. And that's, these are the suggestions. I mean, I don't know which teacher, everybody put in things and then we narrowed the focus and looked at it and, I, I think you know, it's excellent because that's how it came about, you know, so. Every student who reads that knows exactly what it means. Yeah. <laughs> it's true, that's absolutely very true. I've actually done my student teaching at Federal Furnace the past two years, so I've been a bit of a fly on the wall. I don't necessarily have any accountability attached to it. I'm just a, there as a part-time participant, but, I mean, the culture change in that stay in assigned area, it, with Dan in place, it's like ants on a path. Whereas last year, it was ants in a field, mm. uh, is I guess <laughs> the best great. metaphor and way to describe it. So it really, it's words, but it's in practice as well in the school. So. And I think we discussed how it, a lot of it is the commonality of kind of just helping these guys deal with their emotions and with their frustrations and with those difficult 
feelings that you sometimes have in school when things are hard or you're having a rough day or or all of that kind of thing you know we want to be able to have have everybody um, cope effectively but also safely and respectfully and all the stuff that, that you need to do when when you're in a school building. Dr. Maestas. Just one uh, comment uh, observation and, and um, credit to, to the school and and to the leadership team and the school council because this conversation is sensitive. It's sensitive because you have to be honest, you have to be transparent, and that's what it takes to really focus in on what's important. And I really give you a lot of credit for, for putting a foot in the water and wanting to make that uh, strong move to really notice what's going to help your school become what it needs to be. Our kids, like Ms. Tenbrook said, there's, there's, there's great kids yep. in, in that school. There are great kids in all our schools. But how do we as school leaders, as improvement teams, really take a look at what's really going to make a difference for our population? I think your report has begun to address what you believe collectively is going to begin to make a difference in the lives of those children and their families. Communication is key. And I think that's one of the things that we all um, enjoy when we hear these presentations is the honest look about what is going to make our school what we really know it can become. So I want to compliment you on your work, which is, it's hard to do these, mm -hmm. but it's meaningful work. And I think your presentation has really made it uh, a meaningful opportunity for everyone to kind of open the hood and, and see what's under there. So, Patty. Um, I just wanted to send a message back to the staff and parents. The parents got a million emails from me and <laughs> the staff because um, I got to spend the first two years of my getting to know the staff of FedFern and the parents, and it's a great group of people. And I believe strongly in school culture and accountability and academics, and you guys are on the right path. And just please the whole staff that I feel like I know every one of the staff <laughs> through the interview process and whatnot, but I can't, it makes me proud to hear you all, so. They've done it, they really have I know, they've stepped everything. up. You can't do this alone, as I know as a former principal, you gotta have everyone on the same page. And you all seem to be, yeah, you're all swimming in the same direction, yeah. which is great. Yeah. You know, so. We want to keep them. Yep. <laughs> yeah, you can. <laughs> hey, everybody. Thank you very much. Thank great you. report. Thank Thanks you. For Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dan. By the way, it's the first year I've actually kept up on the slides. I know. <laughs> <laughs> I used to forget about slides. I'm looking at them. I'm going to look up slide one. You get a right one of these days. Before we move on to the next agenda item, is there anybody here who's waiting to speak on the field trips? Because I'll take it out of order if you are, but they're not here yet. So, Dr. So Dr. Maestas, we're back yes. to you. We have another program update tonight. We have our Student Support Services Department, and it's led by Dr. Halpin. And he is a guest tonight, a special guest, and that's Maria De Silva, who is our English Language Education Department head. And uh, they are here tonight to give you an idea of what happens in student support services. So uh, welcome, and um, Maria, welcome to the table. Yeah, thank you. Oh, so Ready. far apart. Good evening, everyone. <laughs> it's like they hate each other. <laughs> Sorry about the, uh, the loud bang there with the microphone. Um, well, so what I'm going to do tonight is uh, I have a, a presentation. I know sometimes my, my slide presentations can be a little intimidating by the number of pages, so. <laughs> I apologize for that, but the way I generally work is I, I might fly through some and I might spend some more time on others. Um, and I know some of you are familiar with a lot of the things that I talk about, so that will help as well. And, you know, Maria here is here tonight, and I, I didn't put her on the spot necessarily to have a, a formal part of the presentation, um, but I know um, I've shifted things this year a little bit to, to do the ELA portion at the end. And uh, I'd like to obviously open up to any questions you may have. Um, and if Maria has any thoughts that you'd like to share at the end, she's She's welcome to do that, uh, but I'm, I'm just grateful to be here tonight. Uh, I hope that as I go through my presentation, um, I can kind of update you on what's going on and, and give you an idea of, um, you know, not only the promising things that are happening in Plymouth, but the things that we do need to continue to work on um, to, to get better as a district. So uh, just by way of, of what the Student Support Service Department does, uh, you can see that uh, generally we focus on the general ed programs for students uh, in Plymouth. And the different areas there uh, on the screen, I can let you just take a peek at those. I won't run through them all. I'll hit, I'll hit on them now as I go through my presentation, though. 
Um, the, the school counseling program uh, is, is a vital part of, of student support services. And it's important to remember that uh, we do have focus areas in the school counseling program uh, that we, we certainly are compelled to be interested in, in students' academic achievement uh, primarily. Um, but there are two other areas that we focus on as well, uh, career and college planning, as well as the social emotional well-being of our kids. And everything we do really centers in those areas in the school counseling department, and it falls in line with all the state standards, the, the national standards, as well as I'm happy to report um, the district improvement plan, which always includes those pieces, and I think that's important for us to remember. Uh, some of the things that we do on a yearly basis, um, I've, I've listed on this slide, um, we continue to, to run the Naviance program for our kids uh, grade 6 through 12, and we have uh, individual lessons that we work on with the students in small groups. Uh, we've been pretty consistent with that program um, in terms of its uh, curriculum. We're going to make a change next year that I can inform you of, and it has to do with the, uh, the CPR audit requiring something a little bit more in-depth for ninth graders, which we will do uh, for them next year uh, in terms of career placement uh, inventories. Uh, but this is the, the Naviance curriculum in a nutshell, and then we also have group counseling for kids to help them with the, uh, the scheduling process, which we're starting uh, this week, uh, matter of fact. Uh, we have individual meetings with our kids every year. The counselors meet regularly, and then we like to make sure that we have um, appropriate parent programs as well. And on the screen, they're broken down by fall, winter, and spring. And then this is the nice slide that kind of uh, we, we send out for social media purposes. We do have a night. Uh, coming up in March, actually, for the uh, after the college acceptance uh, presentation that MIFA will come help with. And uh, I guess I just add that we, we've uh, had a good year, I think, in terms of parental support for our programs. The attendance has been really strong. Uh, the MIFA nights went really well at both high schools when we did the financial aid help uh, for parents, so we're encouraged by that. Staffing on this slide hasn't changed a lot um, from last year. However, we do have some little internal changes that we've kind of been dealing with on, on certain levels like with maternity leaves, um, so certain positions sometimes that we're finding that uh, school psychologist, that position is, is a challenging one to fill. Um, and so uh, we've had to make some adjustments on the fly, particularly at North, we have an adjustment counselor there uh, this year as opposed to a, a full-time school psychologist. But other than that, um, our staffing is, is, is pretty steady. Um, I'm working with, with Patty, obviously, on that, and uh, Stacy Rogers in terms of moving forward with, with how we're going to fill that position. Um, we, we, we feel very, uh, I guess, grateful uh, to be in a district that uh, values uh, the role of support personnel, uh, including school psychologists, guidance counselors, uh, adjustment counselors, and other folks who are really important in working with our kids. Um, some of the professional development that uh, we've been working on this year and will continue to work on, these are the, the items that have come um, to the forefront this year, and this is through um, some research on my own as well as trying to get input from staff um, and other uh, key stakeholders on what areas are, are, are important for us to look at in terms of uh, training the councils and the support staff. Um, we'll be looking at trying to make uh, some additional changes next year as we plan our professional development. Uh, I'm trying to think of uh, what might be something that would be important from this year. I think, you know, we did do some collaboration this year uh, between the nurses and the school counselors, which, is, which has helped open up some communication lines. Uh, also, kind of touching on Mr. Harrell's presentation in the school improvement plan, we've been looking more at elementary RTI and PBIS, trying to work with the school psychologists and the adjustment counselors around implementing um, plans uh, that we can include for students uh, to, to, to be successful academically um, through the RTI process. And I think we're going to be continuing that through the end of this year into next year as well. Um, just shifting gears a little bit, um, I know you know Mr. Amaral, the attendance super supervisor. Uh, each year we, we get together and establish goals. So this year for him, he's established these three goals. And uh, the first one has been really effective and helpful for him. Although he's been using Aspen for years, we set up a system in place for him to actually be able to track each student that's on his caseload. Um, and, and, you know, there's a, there's a little flag that goes up for a student who's absent. He's able to see that now and, and kind of act accordingly if he needs to, uh, you know, that morning to try to assist the student. Um, I'll get into that a little bit more on the next slide. Um, trying to increase his participation in-child study team meetings at the school level, and he's also developed a small uh, collaboration of folks. It's been a challenge for him, but um, 
in terms of other folks who are in that role and, and his collaboration with them to learn from, from him and, and each other. So uh, he's, been, he's been working on that as well. And uh, this is data around the attendance supervisor's work. And years ago, Dr. Maestas uh, helped start this Google form, which was great. Uh, it's a referral form that, uh, that Mr. Amar uses, um, you know, and I have access to it, and a couple other folks have access to it as well. You can see that um, in terms of referrals this year, he's probably up to maybe over 80 now. That did this, you know, about a week ago. I was getting ready for the presentation. Um, we've had an increase in residency verifications this year. Um, 30 percent is a little high when I look back on the other years, um, and so he does a lot of work around that. Um, about 103 home visits included in that. That's how many times he's been out to student homes this year, um, basically to get him into school. <laughs> Sometimes some wellness checks. We've had him do a couple of visits on homeschooling plans as well. Um, you can see, too, that, uh, you know, this year um, the residency verifications have been up. Uh, the towns that he's been in to help us with that are Bourne, Carver, Duxbury, Kingston, Wareham, and he does in interdistrict uh, residency verifications as well. Um, I think that would be probably the, the most important piece for, for him. Uh, the next two slides I'm going to go through quickly because it's going to lead into the McKinney Vinto uh, and, and, and homeless uh, situation as well as foster care. So I, I, I keep this slide up because it describes the law, and I know you folks kind of take a look at this and you're able to preview it a little bit. It, it describes the, um, you know, the categories of homelessness um, as well as some of the key provisions to the law. And then for foster care, it's, this is the same slide, uh, but it just explains the law a little differently. And the thing that you want to remember about foster care is there are a lot of different categories of foster care. It's a wide umbrella. So any student in any of these different areas that you see in the, in the, in the red bullets are considered foster care. Um, now, this next slide is the one that I wanted you to kind of take a look at because the whole idea behind the law is that we're going to remove barriers for children either in, that are homeless or that are in foster care. And it's hard to, to, to really remember all the specific, specifics of the law, and I work with the schools on this to try to make sure that they understand, you know, um, what we need to do for kids when they're in these situations. So this slide just really kind of summarizes the differences between the two, and if you look at the red, the, the, those are the differences. Uh, so really, the, the issue is that um, for both students that are, that are homeless or in foster care, we're obligated to continue to allow them to stay in our schools, to educate them, and to transport them, okay? For students that are, that are homeless, they can stay in their school of origin for as long as they are homeless. Uh, and that can go from elementary to middle to high school. Um, and, you know, if I pull the data out, we've had some kids who have, have spent years in that category. We, we, we try to make sure we're looking at, at why and, 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 and making sure that they, they have everything they need, um, but that, um, the, the homeless provisions are pretty, pretty far and wide. For foster care, students can remain in the school of origin up through the year they finish that school. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. um, and the difference, the big difference for us from a cost standpoint is that for foster care, there are no, no cost share provisions, okay? And that leads right into this next slide, I believe. Yeah, and this, this slide is, is, I know I've come back uh, year after year and talked to you about this. The, the costs are going up again. And, and when the law changed in 2016, I think I mentioned that, you know, the, the practice of the law hadn't caught up yet with the costs. We're starting to see it now. So you can see that top row, you know, and this, this is really like all the bills we've paid thus far, and it's as close mm -hmm. to being accurate as possible, but we're up over 200,000 already. And I think uh, a, for transportation costs, a big part of that reason is because of the, the 44 foster care students where we are bearing the cost of those, of those kids, okay? Um, and I work with Mr. Costin on this, making sure that he has an idea of, you know, where we are uh, during different times of the year in terms of our spending for foster care transportation. So, and that's a little historical perspective, really, uh, that I just wanted you to take a look at. So um, we, do, we do budget for this, though, which, which, you know, I'm grateful for, and, um, and we get the kids to and from school, which is the important thing that we want to make sure um, that we're aware of. And the last thing I'd mention about this is um, I've spent a lot more time this year in my role doing best interest determination meetings for kids who are in foster care uh, with, with DCF people, with folks from the school, 
and with people from the other town where the student may be living to make some determinations around what's going to be the best interest for the student, whether to stay if, if, if they've been relocated to a foster family outside of Plymouth, whether they should go to that school if it's going to be a long-term foster placement. Uh, the law gives them the right to stay in our school, but sometimes it might be in their best interest to actually go to the school where they're living. So we've done a lot of that this year in terms of uh, best interest determinations. Okay, shifting gears a little bit, um, general ed tutoring. Uh, as you know, we work with the special ed department to provide tutoring for students who are out for medical reasons uh, or if they're out for extended periods of time due to discipline. The, the discipline numbers are up a little bit this year. It's still not like highly concerning, but we're at about 14%, and I'll go to the next slide to explain that a little bit. Um, there's the breakdown of all the students this year so far across the district who have been tutored for either medical, uh, mental health, or discipline reasons, and it's like at 93 is the number right now. That's, that's pretty close to what we're around this time of year, almost every year, so it's not a really higher number. Um, the difference is, like I said, I think last year when we had a 2 or 3 percent were due to discipline, we're, we're up a little higher on, on the discipline piece. Um, okay. Home ed plans, uh, oh, you know the routine, uh, what, they, what the parents and families have to do um, to have their child um, educated through their home by the law. This is the uh, data around home ed plans for this year. Actually, you have two on the agenda tonight, I know, um, and so this doesn't reflect, it's really 104, there's a fourth and a sixth grader. This came in a week or two ago, um, and we had a family from, um, their kids were attending school in Duxbury, a Montessori school, and they're taking them out to travel for a year, so they're homeschooling wow. their kids, but that's the number of homeschool plans, and this slide all right, yeah. So we're at 104. This is historical data. You know, we, we're usually between about um, 90 and 110 on average, so um, I think we're, we're pretty steady in terms of homemade plans. And you're also familiar with uh, what we're doing to increase the level of social-emotional support in our schools, okay? Years ago, we started this with South Bay. We had a grant. Um, I think I put, did I put up the number of years? No, I didn't. I think we're in like the fifth year, if I have that right, um, of this. But we've actually expanded the number of providers in the district, and I think it's helped. I think, um, I don't want to, maybe it's healthy competition. I don't know if that's the best way to put it, but uh, these, these different providers are working well together, knowing that there's other providers in the school. It's not like we have like this one provider that just provides everything now. And uh, Gosnold, as you can see, um, they have the most number of counselors in our schools now. They, they've uh, been excellent in terms of providing a level of service for our kids. They have a point person who really pays attention to everything and makes sure that the uh, clinicians are licensed, that they're going to do well with the kids. Um, so we've, we've done, I think, a, a pretty good job. And, uh, you know, if you, if you talk to the principals, they'll give you some feedback on how this is assisting um, the schools. And uh, these numbers are a little higher in terms of the, the level of service and the number of students that we have provided a service for. Uh, not, not significantly, but um, a little bit higher than what we saw in past years, basically because of the number of folks we have now working in the schools. These challenges continue to be areas of focus, um, and we will be continuing to, to work on this. And I, I, I feel like this is something that I'm constantly just trying to make sure is, is, is on my radar, I know it's on the radar of other administrators and the people in the school departments who um, we're trying to make sure we challenge kids but also provide them a level of support that's going to help educate them the best, okay? Um, and I know that um, psychosocial issues continue to be something that we, we try to, to do what we can within a school uh, environment to, to provide them with support. Some of the things that I just want to point out quickly um, that we've been working on in addition to, you know, we, we've been looking at a middle school schedule change for a while now, and um, we, we're still looking at that. Uh, we've, we've worked hard with a committee of people um, for probably about a year and a half, and um, we seem to be getting closer, but we've hit, some, hit a few snags, um, but we are working on some options. That's the easiest way to put it, and I know that we'll, when we have a change, if we have a change, we'll have an update for you on that as well. Um, we're in year two of Preventure, and um, I'm, I'm happy to report that you know, we've been able to increase the number of students from about, what, about 40 last year to, to maybe, we've probably close to tripled it, not quite. Um, the number of sections of workshops have tripled, basically. And uh, 
it's been a lot of fun to work with the kids. Um, and it's, it's, it's good to see students um, being engaged in thinking about their decisions. And um, that's been, it's been, a, I think, a, a very good program. And we look forward to training more people to become facilitators as we go to year three next year. Uh, you can read some of the other pieces. Um, I know you've, you've heard about Panorama. We're, we're using that software program uh, in the grade 6 through 12 level to help uh, identify student supports um, through, it, through a, uh, the computer model. Um, and we are also looking to, to roll that out to teachers um, relatively soon as well, uh, because now it's just uh, administrators and support personnel who have access to that information. Um, those are the items you can read through. I'm just going to kind of move along here. In the interest of time, I'm glad I, there's going to come a year I'm not going to be able to put this slide up. I, mm. I'm, 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 mm. I'm dreading that. I'll pick another slide up. Mm -hmm. I'll pick another statistic. I, I like to give people some good mm. information, some good data. I think this is really uh, something to be proud of in our district in terms of the exposure we've given kids to advanced placement courses um, and, and, and the, you know, the, the work they're doing in, in terms of doing well on the test. You know, there's a flip side to that. We've had recent discussions around sort of like the pressures that kids face in high school with all of the, the, the college expectations. And I know that that's something we're looking to try to balance as well. Um, but we should certainly be very, very happy that, you know, our kids are, um, are, are challenging themselves and, and doing well. And we want to make sure that they're, they're doing that in a healthy way. So I guess the easiest way to put it moving forward. Um, in terms of just recognizing some key people, and there, there's too many people that I, I, don't, I don't put enough on the screen, but um, I'm just really proud of the work that, that people do every day working with kids. Um, my the department heads at the high school for guidance do, do an excellent job. Um, and then we have people stepping up uh, across the district to, to help with these, these workshops we do for parents. Um, and you can see their names right up on the screen, um, kind of shifting gears a little bit. And I, it, it's why part of the reason I invited Maria tonight um, she's just done such an outstanding job with our, with our students, um, you know, at, at North High, at PCS, PCIS years before that. But even for me coming in um, as an administrator, you know, I hadn't had a lot of exposure to uh, English learner education. Um, I worked in Barnstable and I, I did it, you know, for those years. And I was over in Sandwich and it was a lot different. And so then I came here and you know, I've, I've learned the most um, f about that really from Maria and other people. And um, so she's like, always you know doing a great job with the kids but at the same time she understands the um, all the different nuances of of what goes on in trying to trying to educate those those students and, and doing that well uh, so I'm gonna go now to that portion of, of the um, of the presentation okay and um, these are some acronyms and I keep I, I put these up and I may add some new ones every year um, there's so many acronyms um, and there's English learner education has so many of them, it's hard to remember them, uh, but they're all really important, right? You know, um, so when Maria and I talk, we don't use any words, we just go with <laughs> letters. <laughs> um, so, uh, yeah, we, we've updated Aspen to help us uh, identify students a little bit better. Um, so those are some of the key pieces. And what's my next one? Okay, this, this is a, a, good, um, a good graph because it shows the increase just in the last year of the number of um, English learner students in the district. So we've had a pretty good spike, if you see that, up to about 125. Mm -hmm. And this is the profile of our, of our English learner students. You can see, um, you know, Portuguese is still steady uh, at about 80%. And I'm literally counting those numbers. It's, 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 it's still 80%, you know. Um, but also, we have a great representation of, of many different languages that are spoken at home as well. You can see from the list, uh, the numbers that from the last slide now kind of broken out by school or by ESL instructor, you can see what that looks like. And we were fortunate to be able to have the additional um, personnel, the point for uh, Natalia over at Hedge, um, because the student numbers uh, increased to, to uh, support that, okay? Um, yeah, let me see. Some of the key pieces that we're working on uh, in, in the department, obviously the access testing this year, which, which we did for the first time online uh, with the kids. Uh, and, and from what I, the feedback I've gotten from everyone is it went really well. Um, it was a little scary right before we got started just to get, make sure all the technology got together, but it, it, we, we got it done. Uh, the kids seemed to do well. We get the scores uh, June, right at the end of the year. 
um, the, the coordinated program review, the CPR audit, we are working on some corrective action pieces, and um, that includes making sure that when we have students exit that they meet the state criteria on the access test. That was the big thing. Um, what we had been doing at times was allowing students to exit based on other data, not just their access scores. And so we have um, adjusted our practice to make sure that we're, they meet a minimum threshold. Um, the SEI endorsement pieces, we continue to run courses. We have a lot of teachers getting um, cert certified in the endorsement. And uh, we also continue to run many 15 PDP credit classes as well. Maria teaches um, a variety of <coughs> topics now on that, which is great. And we have um, our family engagement liaison, I, me I mentioned her on the other side, uh, Mari Costa, who's really just on the ground with families helping them um, as much as possible with, with not just their interpretation needs, but she's like, she'll do just about anything that we ask to try to help assist these families to get them comfortable um, you know, in our district, which we're grateful for. And Maria and I, with the help of maybe some other uh, ESL teachers, we're gonna start a, a parent advisory committee. We're in the process of, of getting that going. We'd like to have like our first meeting before the end of the school year this year. We've, we've been planning that. Uh, we don't have a date yet, but that's on our list of things to do. So I probably spent enough time. Um, I covered just about everything I wanted to, uh, but I'm happy to take questions. And like, I didn't want to put Maria on the spot, but she's here <laughs> and she's a wealth of information. So, late for me. Yeah. and this is late for uh. me. <laughs> Maria, thanks for coming here this evening. Yeah. Uh, committee members with, uh, with questions. Ms. Hunt. I kind of feel like you need an entire meeting for your presentation because <laughs> you cover, I could like you ask you down. a million questions. There's so many things. Okay. Um, just, I know, <laughs> just, a, just a couple quick things. Yeah. Um, I love that you had said that you want to do consistency across the schools and we've been talking a lot about mindfulness and what different schools are doing you know, some teachers are learning to do the Calm app and some are doing other things. So I didn't know if you have started any programming or anything like that to... You know, I've thought about it a lot. And, and I mean, I have an opinion on it, so it, it is my, it's, it's my opinion. And it might, it might not be like the committee may not agree with me. I understand yeah. that. So I, I think mindfulness is very popular right now. Right. Um, but I also think that as educators, we have to make sure we're doing research-based practices all the exactly. time. And the research out on it is not necessarily completely encouraging, especially for younger people. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I don't know that it's the best. And I, but also at the same time, we've had people, I've had people come in and do workshops on mindfulness because it may be a nice trick of the trade mm -hmm. for the teacher to have who's good at it and maybe I'll just like to yeah. kind of help um, holistically kind of make comic kid down a bit but right. I don't know that in you know in from my perspective that I'm ready to embrace it yeah. as something that the school district should yeah. sort of move forward with All that's right. yeah. well not that, that's why my question because I I think the amount of incidents that we've had this year have been overwhelming and alarming and something needs to be done so but when you hear that a teacher might have like learned something on the internet on their own and that they're doing it but yeah, it's not something that they're taught by a professional so that's that, then i my agree question. with you because the, and so what i've done is made sure that if anyone's come in it's been people who are actually professionals who right. understand it like it, and i i go back to almost what mr harold said about in terms of how to how to affect change in a school mm -hmm. um in terms of it's a multifaceted approach yeah. and i think that um having academics be the primary area of focus, um, behavioral expectations, uh, supports, things like that, that to me are much more effective than, you know, quote, a, a, like a, a program, so, so to speak. And, and that's just, that, that's my, and I've looked at it because believe me, it's, it's, it's come up as something and I'm, I'm sure people like you know, knocking on the door in, in, in many ways trying to get this to happen. I may follow up mm. on that. Um, I agree. Um, I think you find this in all areas, not just social, emotional learning, but math, ELA. Sometimes we'll have something that someone sees and this is fun and I want to bring yeah. it into my classroom. So how do we do something and we do it with fidelity, right? We want to make sure that, and so when I speak to the health tonight, some of the things that we're looking at in terms of social, emotional learning, because that's what we're talking about here, is how do we give kids those tools as soon as they step in to the classroom that's common 
-hmm. So that when we're talking about academic expectations, um, social emotional learning, empathy, emotional management, problem solving, we're instructing students because kids need instruction on these mm -hmm. things, right? It's not just something that they acquire, right? Yeah. We have to give them the tools and then the conditions to put those into practice, mm -hmm. right? So the one thing that we're looking at and we've implemented this year, which I'll get into a little bit later, is the social emotional part of the health curriculum. Mm -hmm. And, and that, you know, and that is evidence-based and research-based. So sticking with that, teachers will always bring in, so, uh, you know, some mindful, mindfulness minutes, and that's fine. That's mm -hmm. good. That's an extra thing to do. I used to do brain gym <coughs> as a teacher, get them up moving, right? Mm -hmm. But it's not the curriculum. Yeah. So there's a there's a balance. There's a difference between a curriculum and uh, a nice practice, a tool that a, you know a teacher has. So we have to you know, give them the, the curriculum and then, you know, support certain tools, I guess. And after, I mean, initially, my mind would go to the health curriculum yeah. to address that, but after listening to Mr. Halpin, I'm thinking, this is you too, or, it, but like I said, you encompass so much, yep. um, and where you have all, you know, you handle the management of all the counselors that are in the school, and those numbers are rising, the kids that are using those services. So to, to just to answer that, maybe from a different point of view, like what we are trying to do is, is, is have the counselors be more comfortable mm. with the social emotional piece for kids, yeah. you know, especially folks who came in wanting to be guidance counselors and, and, and you know, which is there's, there's plenty of work for guidance counselors to do. But the, the you know, the, the, the model of a guidance counselor 25 years ago was, you know, you're going to look at a transcript and you're going to advise a student what to take next year and, and, and maybe give them a, a, a possible career or a college track, well, it's shifted. And, and, and you know, that social-emotional piece, which is one-third of, of what their job is, is a big portion of it now. So, and, and the younger folks who get into counseling understand that, but we just want to make sure that we're equipping them with the skills they need to be able to, uh, to, to address those issues mm -hmm. the best they can for kids, to work with uh, adjustment counselors and school psychs who may have a little bit more of that background in their training mm -hmm. and so we are we're definitely trying to do that um, because it's 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 necessary we have you know we have to to be preventive proactive um, and so we're not just chasing things all the time which you know in schools that, that can happen I mean things just happen but um, we want to be intentional about our planning to, to make sure that that the councils are equipped yeah. are you I, well, I had a second one, but yeah, I'll every, go every, after everybody else has. Yeah, go ahead. Yep. You're going to be here all night. <laughs> I was, like I said, you need your own night. <laughs> um, I was just <laughs> noticing that, that throughout here with the figures, there's no figures here with the alternative school on any of the, uh, how uh, well, many is served or whatever. I'm trying to think about um, the, the alternative high school was PHA in the, in the slide for um, the That's tutoring. Okay. And um, where else would it? Well, so we don't have... Um, We've had one EL student at the alternative Any high school, correct? Social, emotional, or health services is what I was kind of going for. And so what was the question about the that? Social, emotional, so health services is on, on the alternative school oh, students. Oh, I see. Well, I mean, um, I do work a lot with Mr. Avitaboli, uh in terms of just planning and programming. Um, I mean, he... Ahead, um, in regards to staff, their um, student enrollment is uh, close to 40, but they have a full-time dedicated guidance counselor, adjustment oh, counselor as well. So oh, okay. I know that's been a big piece. And he's also worked, um, it's fun having them at the building with us. I, I get excited <laughs> to be down there. Um, but the, also he's worked very closely with Kelly Macomber from PYDC, Kelly, um, yeah. to work on different types of strategies. And he's brought in a number of social emotional supports, I know, as All well. Right. So it wouldn't so, be in his figures. Yes, then. yep, yeah. exactly. Okay. Thank you. I'm You're welcome. Sorry. Thank you. Ms. Hayward. Oh, okay. Um, so I guess my question is, um, when we look at the challenges, uh, it says the continued increase of um, psychosocial um, issues and our family issues. Um, how, how are we addressing this, or how, are, do we have the ability to accommodate well, for I, those? Well, I, I think, um, I think it's, a, it, like, it's a challenge, so I'm mm -hmm. restating myself. Uh, the, the level of um, intricate, complex problems that we're seeing, I think, are... are um, just, just evident. Uh, it's hard to measure sometimes exactly what the what, what progress you're making in in terms of, especially like the root issues that we're seeing. Um, a lot of the, the issues that come up tend to be um, problems or situations that kids might bring into school uh, that sometimes can can flow over from home situations. 
what we're trying to do is, is, is I think, make the environment uh, safe and suitable and, and appropriate for kids to learn. Mm -hmm. um, and I think there's, there's many ways that we, we, we try to do that. Um, and I, I would go back to looking at some of the real objective measures that we can look at in education to see how our kids are doing. Mm -hmm. um, and I didn't well, put all of those, those numbers up on the slides. I've done that in the past at times. And those are things like grades and attendance and um, discipline. discipline referrals. And that, that's how we can look at <coughs> it, and that's how we can measure our success. Um, you know, my, my role in the district is to make sure that we're doing that, and at the same time, what we're supporting kids and families the best we can. And that's, that's, that's um, it, it's a harder thing to measure. So. I don't, and I'm not, I guess I'm, I'm not talking necessarily about measurement per se, because I know that there are some proactive um, measures that are being taken, like, for instance, the prevention and pre um, parental we're, we're at least trying to focus on what kids could be at risk. But when you do have these, you know, increased issues that mm -hmm. um, occur, you know, do we, do we have enough adjustment counselors? Do we have... Oh, I see. Yeah. This, well, yeah. I, I, I do, I think that... Um, Staffing-wise, I actually think we're, we're in a decent place. I, and, I, and I've said that for a long time. Um, I think, you know, the, the part of the reason why we have outside providers come in is because mm -hmm. they, they have a level of expertise that's a little different, and we're, we're able to work with them. Okay. And, 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 and it's, it's a win-win situation. Mm -hmm. uh, but you could look at our numbers uh, in Plymouth and compare them to some of the other districts around, and um, we're, we're, we're okay. I'll tell you, you know, people would also argue that, hey, you know, if you, if you brought some school guidance counselors in or just we could use a few more <laughs> they'd be the first ones to say that mm -hmm. I, from my perspective we're, we're actually the staffing is good um you know we need to just get better at our craft and and continue to to, to work to improve um what we do with kids every day sort of as a team approach okay. uh, in terms of like all the other people that we have working in the building together to provide that structured environment for kids to to, to have a, a self a safe healthy place to learn and in terms of like skill set, um, are we, um, I guess, education for the adjustment counselors? Just when we have, because you know, you can have a student that's at risk, and um, and then there are students that these apparent behaviors come up, and they don't fit that profile. And so, what happens when? Because our students are essentially a, a reflection of our society as a whole. So, what happens when you have those behaviors that kind of like pervade? Well, I think we, we try to respond uh, in a way that's going to be supportive to, to give them what they need, uh -huh. not just in the school, but outside of the school. And we, uh -huh. we do a lot of work with the community providers, um, you know, we, and, and, and they, these situations become difficult and delicate. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I would think that for many, maybe not all, but many of these students feel very well supported in school uh -huh. because of those uh, structures and environments that we have set up for them uh, to, be, to, to be successful. Um, and that's not, you know, a hundred percent rate on that. I mean, there's always issues, uh, but I, I think we have the right people in the right places trying to do the right thing, and we're trying to get better every day with that. And and I just put it up there because I, I, I the, the problems continue to, be, to my mind, get like more significant. You yes. Know? And, mm -hmm. yes. And I get your question, yeah. and it, it it's hard. Yes. Um, we, but we we need the right people in the right places doing the right thing. And I, think that's that's I, I think that's a, a, a really good question because the term that comes to mind is wraparound services because what we have done in the school system is address the emerging need. Yeah. And that emergent need is a different shape and form. And I think we've acknowledged that. I think our staff under Sean's direction have, have done a good job of trying to keep up with the trending of what we're seeing today. Mm -hmm. The problem that we see is that um, it should be a lot more than six hours a day, mm -hmm. that there should be more and more services, familiar family services, but, but sometimes more intensive. Yes. And one of the things that we've done with PYDC is our work is really how do we bring the mm -hmm. information that Sean has to the community so that they can plan appropriately for the services that they should be providing to help with that wraparound care. Mm -hmm. So we have approached it as a whole community in the sense, and I think PYDC has been at the center of that. Um, the stakeholders that come to our meetings, uh, Sean shares this information, we share this information about the emerging trends and the things that we need support with. So when these 
uh, community service organizations have come together, their staffing and planning programs to be able to address some of the concerns. I mean, in, uh, we're a lot better at what we do as a community, and it's taken a while to get here. I believe in the next three, four, five years, we'll see even more supports coming to the table. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, everyone is in the same position. Mm -hmm. Every organization is uh, accountable for staffing. They're accountable for how they get paid. They're accountable for all these other contributing factors. So I think as far as a community as a whole addressing an emerging problem, mm -hmm. I think we have a good model. It's just, it's a dynamic that I think we've all had to try to figure out on the fly uh, because it has changed. Mm -hmm. um, and it's hard to pinpoint exactly why, um, but I think, you know, we're, we're doing an okay job at, of addressing it because I would say we, we would we'd do a much better job if we had um, a pulse of exactly why these things are actually happening at the level that they are. I think you, you can point at, um, the, you know, the drug addiction, you can point, you can point at um, a lot of uh, emerging factors that we're seeing in schools, but it's really difficult. And I think this is just not Plymouth. This is school districts oh, around course. the country that yeah. are struggling with the yeah. same dynamics. So I, I, we could talk about this yeah. all night. Yeah. Yeah. As we know, the, the majority of children in America don't live with both biological parents, I, the majority of children. And that's a key issue, the breakdown of the family unit. I want, I want to sort of dovetail these last two comments, and then we'll go to Ms. Padgett, uh, with, another, with another observation. Uh, uh, we, have pro we have trouble, as many districts in Massachusetts, finding school psychologists. Dr. Halpert, uh, Dr. Campbell and I just had this conversation a week ago. I know from having taught in the doctoral program at Northeastern and been in some of these conversations, uh, high, uh, graduate school programs across the country train school psychologists to be much more than testers. They train them with clinical skills. And so now, if you were to hire a school psychologist who came out of one, they wouldn't want to come to Massachusetts because they don't get to use their clinical skills. So therefore, we have a dearth of school psychologists in Massachusetts. And we also have a social emotional need at the same time. Mm -hmm. So if we were to redefine the role of the school psychologist, not only did the testing and did the special education, but also used their clinical skills, we probably would attract candidates from universities outside of the state, and the dearth wouldn't be there. I believe the position has gotten ruined in Massachusetts since special education became such a powerful piece. Thank you. So it's worth thinking about. And I think that addresses that. social and emotional needs as well. Ms. Badger. Thank you for that answer because that was actually one of my questions was wondering why we were having that problem with school psychologists. So, so thank you. Um, and I just also thank you for the clarification about that we're giving our teachers a um, more education on how to deal with our students that are having social emotional issues because I know I've heard in the past that some of our students don't feel like the teachers know what to do with them. They look at them and they're like, oh, okay, what do I do with you? So I'm glad to hear that that's something that we're improving on and we hear about that all the time. So, but that that's huge. Um, so my, my question, or thank you for everyone else asking some of my questions. So one of, I just wanna kind of take us off of where we are right now and I'm wondering, where you wrote the, the tutors, we have mostly Plymouth Public School teachers. Yeah. Is that a problem you see? Like, I just didn't know if there I was a... I, I, I didn't speak to it because I okay. wanted, in the interest yeah. of time, <laughs> but um, it's better when we have Plymouth School teachers okay. doing it because they're familiar with the curriculum, they're committed to the, the district's uh, goals, and they, they, they don't teach the kids directly, we can't do that, but they kind of okay. know the kids and they know the system. It's been it's been great. We have a few people that are like kind of go-to people who really help us out, and we've we've expanded the ability to tutor more difficult subjects because of that, which is always a challenge, you know, for us. So no, um, it's not. It's a good thing. I thought so, but I was just like, there's it's gotta hard, be it's a hard reason for us to why. Actually, <laughs> he said that. It's hard for yeah. us to get work for people that aren't because it's so sporadic. So mm -hmm. you know, if someone wanted to come to the district and tutor. You know, you might have a couple of kids who need tutoring one week, and then then they don't. We don't need it for a little while, and then it picks up again. So it is better for when it's our folks. Okay, and then my other question is, um, for the AP tests, since we're an inclusive, I guess the word would be inclusive district for though anybody can take AP classes regardless. Yes, yeah, we don't require. Um, do we level up in our three four number three four five numbers with other districts just like us because i know when you look at the graph it is still impressive regardless no, think, but with you know, the I, number I, the percentage goes down our, our ap numbers um 
comparative to, to other districts. Like yes. we're, they, they vary by subject. Yeah. So, and I, I didn't mm -hmm. present that data. That would be for another time. But it, it, and there's some ups and downs mm -hmm. on that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right. And yeah. we're uh, constantly. That goes back to the whole day comment. <laughs> 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 that was a whole an overall off aggregate you. Yeah. of test takers, threes, fours, and fives. It's really good information. But if we sub aggregated and looked at chemistry, physics, we went all down the line, you, you'd see. Different. variations and, and there's some sure. pluses and some yeah. minuses. And I think you'll see that um, our participation, as Dr. Halpin pointed out, has gone up yeah. tremendously, right? Mm -hmm. It's like when we took, we decided as a district to do SATs school day mm -hmm. for all. We knew, well, when you're including, you know, 2,000 kids, you're, you're, you know, your sample size is getting larger, therefore your, you know, your performance is going to look uh, inferior to others. But we were okay with that because it was more about um, working with the kids where they're at and trying to set the message <coughs> that college is a possibility and it yeah. gives us good information to help kids um, because of that relationship we have with the college board we get AP, AP potential data yes. which is great for the guidance counselors helps them encourage that we're trying to find the, fi the balance as Dr. Halpin said um, but we do we have some subjects that um, perform better on those exams um, regardless of the number of kids in th that are in those courses and some that um, that, that, that do less well. But we're trying to work with the kids where they're at individually and push them to their greatest potential. Mm -hmm. And we're okay if there's a student who may get a two um, and they did as best they could, but they've had that college level experience and it's yep. gonna help them because the research will say that that will help them in terms of college persistence greater for having that individual experience in that class. So, um, mm -hmm. but we continue to work on it. We, so <laughs> we do a lot of <laughs> professional development and training. Yeah, one other statistical Terrible piece is Plymouth um, <laughs> is known for ensuring that all the kids who participate in AP take the test. Yeah. And there's a number of high right. schools that do not mandate taking of the test. So only a certain, they may take the class, but they do not take the test, where we're mm -hmm. pretty consistent. Um, almost all, always sure. take it. So that's another factor in it. That's true. Yeah. And then I have just one statement, really. I don't know if you've thought about doing a video about Preventure. I think that I've talked to some parents, and where it's presented in different places, it's kind of said differently. Um, so it might just be something to get that yeah. consistent message about it? what it is. We did a video. We did oh. a video, and, and I presented it. Good. I presented at both schools. Perfect. So I'm the one okay. that does it. So. Okay. I, I think I speak the same. I okay. Mean, I just <laughs> heard that it is presented in different lights depending by different parents. Well, different I think people. it was, well, when you go to a parent open house yeah. and it's presented by the principals, a lot different than them coming to when your child yes. is selected. Yeah, that's what I mean, the yeah. introduction of the concept yeah. of prevention. Yeah. I don't know so just that. I, we, you know, <clears throat> we did put out a little video um, yes, and it went out to well all, done, to all the um, <laughs> you know it was it was fine like I it was yeah. it was, no, it was uh, yeah. Dr. Maestas did a little I did and Kelly Maycomb yeah. did a little piece and um, it just summarized what it was and, I mean and I think it was good that we did it like I and like I said earlier we did have an increase in the number of of, of, of kids yeah. so um, it was a good idea and, and and we we did do it we could do it again next year yeah. sequel okay you. any That's any fine. final points Ms. Haywood you can have the last. <laughs> No, um, I guess um, I guess I commend you on the English Learner Parent Advisory Committee are putting that together when that was together and what does that look like? Oh, that? You You've been sitting there the whole time, Maria. What will that look Very like? Very quickly, it has to do with numbers. We've reached a certain <laughs> number over 100. We went from 91 last year to 125 this year, and now it's a, it, we're required to do that. We okay. did try before a number of years ago. Immigrant parents typically work two and three jobs. It's not an easy population to get somewhere in the evening mm -hmm. because they lose out on income for doing that. But we are going to try again at the hedge school. Yeah, so what happened is that Look Act, thank you, Maria, they, they, they came up with a requirement. Districts, if you have over 100 kids, you have to do it. Mm -hmm. But like last year, we were up at around 90, and Maria and I said, we're going to do it. Let's, let's just do it. Like, and we didn't know that the, the bubble was going to continue this mm -hmm. year. And, um, yeah, but I mean, look, look, look at the trend over over six years. We went 51 to 126. Yeah, that line is going up going all up. the time. So, I, and the reason, um, because, so I, I, I am an immigrant, and um, I, w I just think of how my parents probably would have loved this yeah. to just be included, because coming to this country, these are, I'm, like, the skills you kind of lack in terms of, you know, how do you, 
help or kind of bridge that gap in order to like help your your child. So, um, so um, I guess just going forward, I would just love to I learn agree more with you about that that's so important. And Mari Costa that you did also, I don't know if people can hear me. Mari Costa, who also was up, who's our new family engagement liaison. She's not just gold; she's platinum. <laughs> mm -hmm. And having her as someone who can bridge pa parents are coming to Hedge now that have never they're just coming in drove because there's someone there for them. Yes. Mm -hmm. So the idea that someone is there and that we're going to try this and however many parents can come and we will do it probably a couple of times a year but it is an opportunity for bridging that home and school connection with a population that has difficulty with that for various reasons yeah. Ms. Hunt. well uh, that was going to be my second question that i not question well question or comment is um because i <coughs> worked in parent engagement for almost 20 years now and um, I actually am on a statewide committee where we're writing standards for family engagement. I feel like I've been doing that for 15 years, and we keep tweaking it. And we, the problem that we have with these standards is we're trying to find ways to implement them, and that's probably why it is starting with this population, is this is a way that we can start to you know, express how important family engagement is, because 90% of the time, school districts hire a family liaison coordinator when they're a level five school district and the state comes in. The first thing any district does is hire a family engagement coordinator. So we're ahead of the game. I mean, we have to be, but we're ahead of the game. And I'd actually love to see one for the whole district, not everybody, but I think it's really good to start with this population because they are um, you know, it's so important to communicate she does, and, and, with them. No, she, she speaks Portuguese, Brazilian, but she works with... It's with everybody, all, so really that's does. awesome. Like, uh, all the kids. She'll so She'll help all the families. Yeah, yeah and, she does. That's that's a good model. Yeah, works. that's good. The model yes, works. The, mo the model works. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah so... Uh, we could go good. on and on, but <laughs> yeah. that was a great conversation, good Q&A, great yep. presentation. Great. Thank you very much. Thank you all. Thank, thank you, Maria, for coming. Yeah. Maria, thank, thank you for being here. Thank you. Thank you for all you do for The committee's going to take a 10-minute break, so we'll come back in 10 minutes, please. Thank you, everybody, for coming back promptly. Uh, without any objection, I'm going to move the field trips up to, uh, to, at this point in the meeting. So uh, you don't hear an objection? Uh, field trips, Dr. Mayastas. Yes, tonight we have three field trips that we have on the agenda tonight, and uh, we are going to take a look at the um, All-State Music Festival overnight trip, which is to Boston, and I'll turn it over to uh, Mr. Capel and uh, Ms. Holmes. They're here to present the three field trips we have, so turn it over to you. Great. Great. Uh, I'll speak to the uh, MMEA uh, conference field tip trip. Uh, this is a, an event that comes up every year, or every year that we get students into this event. Um, we have students go and audition for the Southeast Massachusetts Music Festival. If they score high enough, they get an All-State rec. That means that they're eligible to audition for Allstate. Um, this year we took three students to the Allstate auditions and then two of them were selected to be in the Allstate chorus. So Johnny Alves and Liam Lonergan um, have been selected to uh, participate in that. It's, uh, they're from Thursday to Saturday and they get to perform with a large group at Symphony Hall on Saturday afternoon. So. Mm -hmm. I think that pretty much sums it's it up. pretty exciting. <laughs> a great opportunity. one at a time. Um, committee members with a request for this field trip. Is there a motion? I'll move it. Uh, Ms. Badger. I move that we uh, approve this uh, SEMSBA field trip. Sec that's been seconded by Ms. Burgess. Any questions on the motion? Okay, we'll take the vote then electronically. <clears throat> Everybody voted mm -hmm. for it. Thank you. Next yeah. one. Thank you. Next yeah. field trip. The next one is the um, uh, VPA banner project. Uh, we've been working on this for quite some time, and Mr. Capel has really been the um, motivating force behind this project, and I'd like to turn it over to him to present information regarding this field trip. Uh, thank you, Dr. Maestas. So uh, before you on this particular field trip um, is Visual Performing Arts District-wide field trip from students in grades uh, 5 through 12 um, in the fall. They would be in, that, in those grades in the fall 
for this trip is in November 23rd, coming back December 1st to the Plymouth, UK. For a number of years, we've been working with the Plymouth College of Art in uh, Plymouth, UK on what we call the Identity Banner Project. Um, we've been, we've had artists uh, from the UK over here working with our students. We've done professional development with our teachers. Um, here we have sent teachers to the Plymouth College of Art um, in past years as well to work on um, this idea and this project. And it really is about groups of students connecting school to school. So every one of our schools, all 12, 12 of them, have a connected school in Plymouth, UK. They've talked um, virtually for, no, for two years. Um, they've worked on the same project um, with, again, some visiting artists at different times, um, really exploring the idea of what, it, what identity means um, uh, to each school, to each student, to the Plymouth, um, Massachusetts, United States, and Plymouth, um, Devon, UK. Um, this is kind of getting to the culminating point, this, this field trip, where um, our students uh, will be selected from, a, from a, a smaller group of students will be selected from the larger week identity banner project to travel to the UK with their completed banners from each school um, to march in the Illuminate, uh, Illuminate uh, celebration uh, in 2019 in, in Plymouth, UK. Um, it's, it's pretty exciting. Um, there's been ups and downs in the projects and challenges and successes, um, but we, uh, as a district, um, as a group of teachers, are determined to uh, give these kids the, uh, the boots on the ground, if you were, uh, in Plymouth, UK, with all of their hard work. The banners should be completed by the end of this year, um, with travel again November 23rd to December 1st. That is during school time. Um, we have, uh, we are kind of tied, we're not kind of, excuse me, we are tied to the schedule there uh, and their um, Illuminate um, celebration. Um, and however, it works out as, f uh, as far as the trip goes because it's only two school days uh, because of no school on Wednesday, Thanksgiving, and no school on Friday. Um, so it works out from our uh, perspective and, and obviously not wanting to take kids out of the classroom longer than we need to. Um, however, it's our belief that uh, this experience for them will um, equal, uh, if not surpass, uh, those two days of, of school for those students. Um, that's an overview. Uh, you have the complete packet in front of you, so I'd be happy to take any questions or comments, concerns uh, from the committee. Ms. Ba Ms. Badger. Uh, Ms. Ms. Hunt. I, <laughs> like I really like on here how you have the fundraisers broken out. I think that's the first time I've seen something yeah. like that, so that's really, really helpful. That's cool. I mean, yeah, I know that we, it's we still try, Yeah, we try to do that. Um, but you we, actually listed the the possible fundraisers, which is yep, great. and we try, and that that's kind of a you know through experience of of all our um, trips, and uh, we'll get to another one shortly, <laughs> um, <laughs> and, and what we've done over over a period of time, uh, and what we think we reasonably can uh, uh, do and raise. Um, I think the the community and the parents have a lot to do with it, and they've always come together um to to work with the school department to uh make those yeah. successful fundraisers it just shows forethought instead of mm. you know, afterthought it's okay. good thank any you any other questions okay then i will take a motion i'll move miss miss hunt second Ooh. Ooh. Michelle. Oh, michelle go ahead i was second it i just hit the I mic <laughs> it was hmm. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we have a motion made by Ms. Hunt, second by Ms. Badger. Is there any questions? All right, we're going to have to take the vote, but I cannot vote electronically, so I, I lost my connection, so we're going to have to take this vote orally. Mm -hmm. So all those in favor? That's unanimous going around. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much. And now the concert <coughs> and marching band field trip. Yes, and the next field trip is the concert marching band, which is a uh, very similar opportunity. I'll turn it over to Mr. Cable to, um, to review that as well. Yeah, thank you. Um, if, if you'll notice, the, the dates are, it's a very similar uh, uh, field <laughs> trip. Uh, we've talked about this for a number of years, um, trying to make this a, a, a celebration, again, of, of many of our students uh, and from different disciplines. Um, I'm going to turn it over to uh, Ms. Holmes to talk a little bit uh, more specifically about the marching band and concert band part. Sure. Some of the, uh, the 
events that we foresee being part of this are um, a is in, in addition to the Illuminate uh, event, but also doing something with the marching band in that context, whether it's marching a distance or performing in a couple of spots there. Uh, we're also looking at doing a concert band event with their youth band in the city of Plymouth. And uh, we've been working out some details of that as well. We would like to uh, oh, yeah. take a day uh, oh, to yeah. sightsee a little in London with the high school kids before we head to Plymouth. And, uh, you know, the times to see that area and, you know, just to see that what culture is and what things are happening there, as well as make connections with students who play instruments in other places, so. I'll, I'll just add that um, Ms. Holmes visited uh, Plymouth a couple of years ago, years perhaps, ago, yeah. um, and kind of started the lay the groundwork for, for this. Um, marching bands uh, in um, UK, uh, certainly in education, are not a major thing, as they are uh, here uh, in the United States. Um, so you went over, taught a little bit uh, with I, the students over there, I did. some the, marching band techniques? The, the marching band <laughs> tends to be more of a military band than mm -hmm. it would be. Uh, then it would be an educational venue. Um, I did. I went to an elementary school where I worked with the band teacher there a little bit. We took the kids outside, taught them to march a little bit, to play some long tones, some long notes while they yeah. moved. <coughs> Probably, uh, I want to say like fourth, fifth graders. I think they say year five, year six, something like that, uh, which was really exciting to see. Also saw the youth band <coughs> at the time we were there. Um, they had a concert that weekend and we were able to see what they're doing and some of their some of their types of ensembles um, and make some of those connections so very exciting it would be our hope that um, if this was approved in a successful trip that we also uh, invite some of our um, UK student friends here in 2020 uh, in the in the Thanksgiving Day Parade to, to march with our marching band here. Again, as, as we've done with the Plymouth International Chorus for a number of years, it really is about students, student exchange, student communication, learning differences uh, and similarities between our, our cultures. Um, I do have to say that um, this works well because this has been years in the in the making. Um, when we went to the UK back in 2013, December, December of 2013. December of 2013. Thank you, Dr. Kim. <laughs> um, and uh, started talking and meeting uh, the so people. It really is all about relationships and, and meeting um, our counterparts over there, certainly in, in music and the arts, and having partners that believe in the same thing to, to kind of uh, make this actually a rea reality. So um, that has that has been a great partnership uh, thus far over the last number of years. Um, same thing with the fundraising, you know, it's broken down in that um, trip. Uh, we have uh, an estimated cost. Um, our costs um, will not be exact until we book the flights. Flights fluctuate and uh, we will do that uh, shortly if, if, if approved. Um, we hope to get that cost down and we do have money uh, available from previous trips to give as financial aid. It's another part of what we believe if a student is uh, eligible and deserving to travel and be a part of this that uh, finances should not be an obstacle that they need to overcome and we um, will have a parent meeting on both of these um, programs if, if approved. Uh, we'll explain it very directly to our parents um, and, and really open the door for, for students that might uh, need a little assistance. Does the tuba need its own seat? <laughs> uh, I'm hoping that the tuba player will play a different instrument okay. for this event. Pickle. We, we've talked about. Uh, we've we've talked about some of the logistics. Of this. I'm just yeah. picturing the them all bringing their instruments out. So this is probably a dumb question, but it's 50 students total from both high schools, not 50 from each. Oh, or cor you correct. And okay. and and so that like number should be. Ish. Um, it it is ish. It's yeah. definitely ish. Yeah. Um, I was just thinking 125 seemed like a lot. No, we're probably <laughs> thinking at about 50. We're thinking at about like honestly, uh, one coach because that's a major travel expense yep. when we're on the ground. You get into another one, you know, mm. the costs get. Um, divided out. Um, however, uh, Ms. Holmes and I have, have talked about if it's, you know, if it's uh, 55 or it's 60 and these kids want to go, we want to make that possible. I think we can with the um, 
the banner trip, um, you know, kind of spreading that out and sharing some of those inherent transportation costs on the ground. Yeah. So we, we're not tied to the 50, either a little less or a little more. We can, we can make it work. Absolutely. Any other questions? Any motions? I'll move it. Ms. Hunt. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Um. Ms. Hunt moves the recommendation. Ms. Burgess is the second. Any questions on the motion? All right. You can please vote. Everybody voted in favor. We win. Thank you uh, very much for your time tonight. Thanks uh, for welcome. always as your from your, for your support of of the arts and Plymouth Public Schools. It's, and we're it's very for recognized. You. Thank you. Yeah. Thank, Thank you. you. Have a good evening. Right. Is there anything under old business that we need to discuss this evening? Um. Ms. Burgess. Here. Yes, <coughs> because it's going to be coming up soon. Um, I didn't realize it was on the old business for some, for some reason. But we're talking about the request for reactivation of the consolidation subcommittee. And this year I was appointed to, to that subcommittee. Uh, I had a hard time finding it. And, and uh, I called who was the chairman and uh, didn't get a response, but finally saw her somewhere. And she said that, well, now it'll be almost three years since it hasn't functioned. I'm, I'm, I'm not clear what we're talking about. The last conversation we had with the Board of Selectmen on consolidation was uh, the superintendent and the town uh, manager yeah. <laughs> uh, were going to work on that. Yeah. I haven't Can found I? it. Can I? Yes. Address that? Um, the motivation and, you know, to get the committee together is uh, that's been up to the town manager to yeah, assemble. I know, yeah. And I have not heard or, or been invited to a meeting yet, so. Yeah. Um, and I mean, I really followed it out, and it just doesn't exist. Mm. Yeah, there, I don't think there is a committee right yeah, now. there isn't. I, I think it's up to the town manager and, and me. Uh, with my support to actually put a, t a team together, and that's I'm still waiting for direction from the town hall. So, okay. just for clarification, if you uh, in the minutes that we're going to approve this evening, Ms. Purchase, there's a there's a couple of sentences in the minutes whereby we met with the board of selectmen about a month ago, and in the minutes it says mm -hmm. that Dr. Maestas and the town manager will be meeting to determine the next step in <coughs> consolidation. That's Absolutely. where we left it. Oh. And so he's reporting that he contacted okay. her and it's still sitting there. It's still sitting, yeah. Right. Uh, okay, because I mean, I've tried to become a member, but there isn't anything to become <laughs> a member of. <laughs> yeah, and, so and I, I think there was Ms. Badger. Ms. Badger. And we also talked about it being staff and not um, committee members because that's they right. know um, their boots on the ground rather than us being like, oh yeah, that mm -hmm. could work. Right, that's where we left that's, it. That's correct. Yeah, okay, that's just making sure. I have not. It's not going to be a committee member. It's going to be yeah, it's going to be yeah. staff that's going oh, to. Oh, all right. To do well, it. It, I, I was a committee member appointed to it. That's who appointed you to that? You. <laughs> uh, for this past year, it's, I'm on the list. I don't have all the right. list with me. I have the list. I'll look later. But let's move on with our agenda. <laughs> <laughs> Anything else under old business? Okay, new business. All right, moving along then. Superintendent's report. Tonight I have uh, three things to report on. Uh, we were successful in uh, calling all the students who uh, were selected to go to Japan. And we have a meeting uh, Wednesday evening at 6 o'clock at Plymouth North High School with uh, parents and students. Mm -hmm. And uh, they will uh, have a lot of information on what they need to do to participate. So that will be about an hour long meeting. Uh, I also had the opportunity to call the students that weren't selected. And as I mentioned during the last school committee meeting, these students, all the tw 27, 26 students that we interviewed, they, they did a fantastic job. Mm -hmm. uh, I wrote There's a letter. There's one that we wouldn't have taken. Uh, uh, if, if, we had, if we didn't have a limit, they would have all gone. Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay, and that's pretty much, con it's, it, that was the consensus of, 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 of the team. Um, uh, Ms. Grimes actually sent letters to um, both groups of students identifying the information, the, the parent meeting and so on. I also uh, sent a letter to students that did not get selected uh, um, extending the opportunity for them to apply 
during their ninth grade going into 10th grade year because those students were extremely prepared. They were very excited, very anxious to, to want to go on the opportunity. So they will have an opportunity to apply again. I told them to keep the letter so that there's acknowledgement that they did interview pr previously. And I, and I hope that that does um, carry some level of, of weight when they move forward. So I did let them know that. Um, the next thing that I'd like to also uh, capture is the uh, preventure workshop um, that we did complete them right before vacation. And I can tell you it's, it's one of the greatest opportunities that I have the, part, uh, the, the pleasure of being part of. And we're, we're just very uh, grateful that we engage in that. The participation is up, and I will tell you, we're getting better at how we market it. We're getting better at how we instruct it. And um, I anticipate we'll have better numbers as we go forward in the years of, of doing this. We, we did get um, uh, some additional assistance from um, Beth Israel Deaconess Plymouth to help us to train more uh, facilitators. And that was a, is, is really a, a great opportunity that they'll help us with, which we're very happy uh, about. Um, and my last thing to report on tonight before we have a, a, a little discussion or, or presentation on, on our health program is a relative to graduation at Plymouth South High School. Graduation at Plymouth South High School will be at Plymouth South High School on the campus this, this year for the first time. I was there at the last graduation, uh, and it was, it was close to 20 years ago. Uh, well, uh, 2002, okay. Uh, uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I was there. It was Not 20 years ago. <laughs> <laughs> I said close. I said close. 17. That was yours? 17. Mm, yeah. 17. I was filming. That was my job at the time. Um. I was on the field and I couldn't hear anything. But anyway, hey, you know what? We're hey, and I was giving I out the palm. I could hear it. Yep, the back of your head is in my picture. <laughs> so, just so everyone knows that we will be driving cross town, uh, not from north to the uh, Memorial <laughs> Hall. And uh, with that said, um, we did talk at the last um, uh, school committee meeting regarding the health curriculum and one of the things that Dr. Sorens and I discussed last week reviewing the agenda is that we would try to put information on the agenda regarding the health uh, the curriculum development at the elementary health program development um, and Dr. Campbell and I talked about this today and he put together a, a, a brief uh, overview of where we are right now and some of the aspects and of course this is something that um, there are a lot of things in motion. Uh, one, we're reviewing our process, we're reviewing our uh, scope and sequence, but we're also looking at um, how the Commonwealth is actually uh, providing additional recommendations and additional guidance on what we do in districts to address some of the issues. And you know, quite, quite frankly, there's some overlap between what we talked about tonight with Dr. Halp and socially, emotionally, mm -hmm. uh, and things of that nature. So. Uh, Dr. Campbell put together some information to share with you tonight to kind of give you a, a little bit more information on how we're progressing with um, the model. So I'll turn it over to Dr. Dr. Campbell, just before you start, I want the committee to know that Ms. Badger reached out to me after our last meeting and recommended, and I thought it was a really good recommendation, that we carry a health curriculum agenda item on each of our agenda items from now until the time that we that we institute the, uh, the actual curriculum because it's, it's a vital, we know it's a vital area. So tonight will be the first of those presentations. Dr. Campbell. Excellent, thank you. Um, and I wish I, actually I was very sick the last meeting and I offered to come in and Dr. Myers is like, no, please stay home. Stay so stay I don't think he wanted no, me to infect all of you talking about health. Yeah. Really wasn't a healthy choice, right? <laughs> uh, or a healthy decision in my head. So um, texting like I was, Michelle yeah. was. Dr. Myers has to tell me otherwise. So, um, <laughs> You know, thank you for this opportunity. I do think it's a great opportunity to, to have some discussion about what's happening, what's currently happening, because we do have a health curriculum, although it's limited in certain, in certain areas, and we're expanding that, and we could talk about that. Um, and we can also have opportunities to, I think, perhaps bring forward some people that are working on some of the things as, that I would be speaking to uh, briefly this evening. So um, as you all know um, very well, our, our health educator in terms of uh, certified health educator at the elementary level is specifically um, suited in grades four and five currently. It's, it's merely because of the uh, numbers, right? Um, we have approximately 1,000 students in, in those grades, so there's only so much that you can do with a certified health educator um, when you have one in that respect, right? So we have one health educator who um, is going 
from classroom to classroom for about once a month. Um, she's very busy. Um, she's doing a, a very good job uh, with that. Um, and she's working with the health curriculum, and that being the, the frameworks that we have, um, which have not been looked at by the state since 1999. Okay. Uh, and I'll talk about that in a minute. Um, but that, that curriculum gets into physical health, social emotional health, safety, community health, personal hygiene, um, and then also growth and development and, and substance substances and substance use and, and prevention. So there's that piece which has always been there. So she does that um, and, sh and she's, doing a, she's doing a good job. Uh, we have health education in all grades at the middle school and then we also have it in grades 9 and 10 at the high school, you know, at least. And there are other kids that may take other classes that are associated or uh, connected to that. Um, last year, um, we received a grant through the district attorney's office to provide additional substance use prevention curriculum um, f which is the Botvin Life Skills Curriculum. It's, a, it's an actual research base that gets into more cognitive behavioral therapy. It's, it's, it's a very, much like we talked to Halpin was talking about, but specifically for substance prevention uh, for our middle schools. It's something that the DA's office um, supported, um, uh, excuse me, the Attorney General's office supported, and um, we were fortunate enough to receive the grant funds to add that curriculum at the middle schools. So we're very happy about that. Um, you all had an opportunity to meet Kelly Maycumber as well. Kelly has done a great job, um, not only through PYDC and the work that uh, Dr. Maestas was talking about, but she's been in classrooms from grades 5 to 12 already. So it's nice to have her to give her expertise and to support our health educators um, as well as our, our student population in areas specific to substance prevention. So she's been doing a lot of work on that. She's done, um, class, she's done health classes at the high school. She's done health classes at the middle school. She's done uh, vaping presentations. She's done, um, she's done presentations and education for students who have had uh, consequences for those actions um, because we feel it's really important to not just provide the consequences but to educate the kids on why they shouldn't be doing what they're doing. Not just because they get in trouble but the health piece of that too. So that's been a nice addition. Um, and then this year, um, staying with the grant funds, we were also, I was very fortunate to receive a $25,000 health education grant to help support the work that we're trying to do this year. So, um, um, and, and that money is being used for curriculum improvements, uh, cu curriculum additions, professional development, and some consultation, which we're doing. Uh, we're currently partnered with Mary Conley, um, some of you may know Mary. Mary uh, used to work for this district a number of years ago when we had a, a much more substantial health program um, years ago. Um, Mary is the program chair of the Skills-Based um, Health and Social-Emotional Learning Department at Cambridge College, um, and she does, a, she does an, a, a, a great job in consulting with a number of districts, and we're, we're one of them right now. So um, over the year, she's helped. Uh, she's helping to strengthen the health and phys ed programs. So we're looking uh, right now, working with Mary with our elementary health to look at that scope and sequence. Uh, and we're really looking at the national health curriculum right now. But M Mary is also part of the discussion at the state level. So the state is finally revisiting their health curriculum. But I know with good authority that a big focus of that health curriculum is around social emotional learning. So you're going to see a large, uh, a large focus on that in the revised frameworks. Um, and, and Mary's is, is great because she's got a great background in this. Um, and, and meeting with her and consulting with her myself in terms of um, the second step curriculum, which I spoke about briefly uh, this evening, that is a social emotional learning curriculum, which is, it, it, which is, very, um, which is a very good program. Um, we, ha we have the most current program, um, and I'll talk about that in a minute. Um, so again, Mary's working on assessing our health curriculum. She's working with our el elementary health educator. So this takes, that work takes time because we're, you know, our health educator is working in the classroom and they were trying to find time to do that. And a lot of this work happens in the summer months in terms of curriculum revisions, right? And during vacations, we try to find that time. Um, so we were very fortunate to use some of those grant funds to, to purchase the most current up-to-date second step curriculum. Uh, the second step curriculum for all of our elementary schools, K to five. So we now have that at all of our elementary schools. 
Um, and again, this is an evidence-based social emotional learning curriculum that gets into, as I said, um, skills for learning, uh, empathy, emotional management, and problem solving. And I can share with you, I have, I have a, a sort of a, a breakdown, uh, which I can happily share with you, what some of those units look like. Um, this is just a basic scope and sequence of what that looks like. So this is present in all the schools. So there's way too much for, what, for the classroom teachers to take on themselves. But this is something that with, with, the, with the collaboration of a health educator and a classroom teacher, speaking the same language, supporting these social mo emotional skills, prioritizing these lessons, that we can work on some really important skills, um, skill-based. We've talked about, Dr. Sorensen and I have talked about this with physical education too, skill-based physical education and not just doing certain lessons, right? Um, so it's getting down to the root skills and giving those kids competencies around physical health, social health, emotional health. Um, and this is a really good program. Uh, we've had some good success with that um, in prior years and we're happy that we have that, um, you know, that we're, we have that again. Um, so moving forward, um, as I said, the health curriculum hasn't been reviewed by the state since 99. Um, Mary's been appointed to that, the, the DESE board to review that and will be working with us as that work comes underway. Um, but we're prioritizing looking at, you know, revising our health curriculum in grades four and five um, immediately. And then um, through the course of this year and in the summer, looking at K through three. Because our goal is to have this from kindergarten through fifth grade, we're working not only on the social emotional curriculum uh, through second step, uh, but also working on those other competencies that I talked about, the physical health, the hygiene, and things like that in a developmentally appropriate way um, for that. So um, in addition to the work that we're doing at the elementary level, um, we do have teacher teams that will be working this summer. We've already, they've already submitted proposals to me to continue the work to re refine our health and physical education curriculum at middle school and high school. So we're always having conversations like that. Um, um, Linda, our elementary per, uh, health educator, who we currently have, um, has been working very well with our middle school health educators to make sure that we're, you know, that that continuum exists um, and we continue to do that. So we're working really hard to expand that curriculum, as, as I said. Uh, the goal is K to five to, to have that presence, and this is the direction in terms of social emotional learning curriculum where we want to go, and everything else will be based on the frameworks and the direction uh, that that's going. But we do have a good national curriculum to use, um, and, and knowing that the state probably won't go too far from that mm -hmm. as well. Happy to okay, answer any uh, questions uh, I may. This is open for discussion now and questions from committee members. Um, so let me start with one. Um, I realize this is our first, this is sort of our first presentation with, with, with the paperwork in front of us. And that we have a lot to learn as a committee, because I have a lot to learn as a committee member where we're going with this. So what I don't, what's unclear to me at this very moment, I listened to your talk, Dr. Campbell, you said this is, this is, this was a second step program, we have this. But who's teaching this? Right now, it, it yes. the classroom teachers. All right, and so so we. I'm asking you, do yep. we believe that this has to be taught by health educators, not the classroom? I teachers? think it needs to be. I think it needs to be reinforced by classroom teachers, and that it would be. A, it would be nice to have health educators that are doing components of that with fidelity, um, and because you can't do all. The, there's a lot here. This is a lot to do. We're asking our health, our classroom teachers to do it about 30 minutes a week. Because it's hard to f how do we how do we find time to fit all that in right? Um, so we're 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 looking at working on discrete skills from K to five, but I, I you know to have a health educator that can focus on that um, because that's their job is really uh, in my opinion the the best way to approach that. We had a conversation earlier tonight about making sure that people that teach are our um, our students come from a qualified background. Correct. Uh, and I, I'm concerned here. We're into topics that classroom teachers. Maybe it's my ignorance that may or may not yeah. be trained. This this um, you, we always need to continue training 
with, with anything that we ask our teachers to do. Th this program um, is designed for classroom teachers, elementary classroom teachers, as well as health educators. Um, teachers are perfectly capable of doing this, but it's just a matter of finding the time to fit within their day and what, at, at, to what degree can we reasonably expect them to, con to, to, you know, to continually add to their plates. So it's um, having, a, having the health educators to um, implement that, like I said, with fidelity is really, the, in my opinion, the best okay. approach. Badger. I know during the budget presentation, not budget presentation, but when we were talking about, um, maybe it was a couple meetings ago, the allocating of, so if we have staff members who leave the district, they retire, whatever happens, we're going to try to allocate that towards health education if we can. Um, how many teachers, how many pe staff members do we need to execute this program the way we need to execute this program? I'm, Additional I'm just curious. or in total? Um, I guess in total, because I mean, like you said, we have one teacher and that covers two grades everywhere. Yeah. And I that's would, a lot. I would, I would feel comfortable with two additional health educators. Okay. Okay. All that, in all the schools? So how, they'd meet <clears throat> once a month with every classroom? Okay. And then the teacher would be responsible up, right? to be like, okay, we don't, you know, we deal with gossip in this way or we deal with our feelings over here. Okay. There, there right. are teachers that are incorporating, I mean, they're, they're, they're looking for tools, right? Yes. And, and there are things that, and you know, we talked about that a little a while ago, right? I and mean, teachers are always looking for tools. An elementary, as a former elementary educator, I can tell you that there, you know, I did lessons like this. They weren't part of a second step program, but you did that because you needed to. It was part of, we used a program called Tribes. It's getting kids, to, you know, mutual respect, uh, appreciation for others you know, the right to pass. There's, there's all kinds of programs out there that classroom teachers are looking to add to their toolbox because there's a need in front of them, right? So, you know, just like academics, students need to be taught certain discrete skills, and, and, and these are those discrete skills. It's nice to have someone who can focus on that and support a classroom teacher as they're navigating some of these things in the context of a circle time when they're meeting about their weekends and having conversations with kids. How do we integrate that naturally into the academics of a kindergarten classroom who does circle time every day and maybe they're going to spend some time and they're going to talk about following directions or focused attention and how do you do that and they practice that. Um, this is going to give a teacher some tools to do that, um, but it's nice to have a health educator that's taking certain lessons, maybe in emotional management and problem solving, but also dabbing into some of these skills for learning and supporting classroom teachers to navigate that. And now you've got a team, right, that can support, eight, you have a team of health educators that can support eight elementary schools, which makes it much more manageable. Ms. Hayward. Um, I guess I guess to piggyback up on uh, Michelle, just so you mentioned there was one health educator for a thousand students. Is that am I wrong? Fourth so and then, fifth grade. Uh, fourth and fifth. Yeah. Huh? Fourth yeah, fourth correct fourth for a fourth, fourth and fifth, fifth okay. grade. And so the two addition, I, I, because yes, the socio most so the second steps does um, cover the um, the social emotional piece, but health education encompasses so much. Um, more than this, so um, how are we able to kind of cover that on an elementary school level? And with, I, I, I hear Kelly's name like throughout and she seems to be covering a lot of areas. Um, is there any way that we could even partner with like our public health director or just defining different? Yeah, so there's, there's other things, right, and I didn't get into that and I can mm. get into greater detail. We're all, you know, also like there are certain lessons, we have other staff okay. in the district, right? So it's, it's looking at, how, this isn't a, something that's going to be completely resolved okay. in a year, but okay. how can we really take a substantial shift in the attention that we're putting on this, right? Um, but our, what are, what's our role for our physical education teachers too? Because we have, we have a, we certainly have more teachers there. Our nurse educators that yeah. can take on certain topics, and in my opinion, are much m most most qualified to take on topics of you know human development, for example, as one example. So there are, we have experts within our school communities already 
it's rethinking and having them work collaboratively with the health educators, the physical education teachers, the classroom teachers to see who owns a piece of what, right? So you're right, and working with the health department and bringing in guest speakers. Sometimes maybe it's not a um, something that's done in the <coughs> curriculum once a month, but there's also going to be opportunities to bring in specific speakers to talk about certain topics and issues related to health and wellness. Dr. Right. Maestas. One of the things that um, I found interesting when we met with Mary Connolly, and I've, I've known Mary for 20 years, and I worked with her directly back when I was a coordinator here. Um, she said the pitfall that most districts fall into is that they look at staffing and they want to hire staff to address it. And she says, you have to break down exactly what's taught now, and you have to actually assign different pieces to what you have for resources. Because most school districts have them, they just don't document exactly where it's done. Mm -hmm. So she said, she said, that's the first thing that you have to do is break it down, what components are being addressed and by who, and then what do your health teachers really come in and teach some of the specialty things that they need to be part of. So that's what we're in the process of doing. And I, what I would like to do in, in the next meeting or, or thereafter is have Mary come in yeah. and, and you can meet her and you can have her kind of walk through exactly what is, what is trending, mm -hmm. but yet what the pitfalls are for school districts when we're all faced with the same thing. Yeah, right. I th and, 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 so, and Mary will do that with our mm -hmm. physical education teachers as well as the health education staff, which I probably should have mentioned because we've mm -hmm. had conversations about that. Um, and you know, here we, and one thing that it's, we're concerned about the amount of health education that we do in our, in our district, but you know, after talking to Mary, I feel better about what we're doing in comparison to some other districts. Mm -hmm. Not that that's okay, mm -hmm. um, because that's not the, the, not the standard. That's <laughs> the standard. standard. We don't yeah. want to set the standard based on what other people are doing if it's low. Um, but I can tell you ha having, you know, consulted and, and, and had conversations with a number of districts, a lot of people aren't putting too much attention with the exception of through their physical education, health, you know, time mm -hmm. at the elementary level. I think that this district is really looking at putting a more concerted focus on mm -hmm. that and trying to find other ways to expand what we're currently doing and also to work on you know, as Dr. Maestas has said, where are all those, and as you said as well, all those resources in our community to really align who's doing what and how do we work smarter yeah. together and more and, and lay out, you know, lay out that scope and sequence so that we know with fidelity that we when we're going to talk about these issues in kindergarten in a developmentally appropriate way, and we're going to continue that conversation up through their high school years so that they're hearing a consistent message and, and that discrete those discrete skills that they need both health and uh, health education and physical education are being um, they're being exposed to regardless of which school they go to mr. Selling. yeah no I was just gonna say just from the presentation it sounds like it's a need for structure essentially yeah. and what I'm interested to see is as we assess this taking taking some of the sort of pressure and the units here that are put on the teachers in the classroom to have a more structured approach with additional health educators but it would be a resource for us to quantify so what we're seeing with social emotional what we're seeing develop what we're seeing change for the better or what needs to be addressed or assessed mm -hmm. therefore there later so the additional health educators come more than just the curriculum but more what's presented and what they're finding in what's presented mm -hmm. that's in the district and I just feel like a structured approach and since I've been on the school board we've talked about this health curriculum and at this grade level being sensitive to that grade but these units the social emotional learning what the teachers can bring into the classroom on top of what they're already teaching I mean that's a lot I mean that's a lot for them to have to implement through circle time right so to have the additional health educators I think would just parlay that extra support and for us you know we can be able to see what's truly happening within the classroom and what the needs of the students may be based on the health curriculum so I'm looking forward to just seeing, you know, mm -hmm. that advance and the structure come into place for sure. Yeah. So thank you. Uh, um, I'll, I'll. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. I'm so, I was so pl so pleased to hear you bring in the physical educators into this discussion, mm -hmm. because they have a vital role in this health curriculum, mm -hmm. and it's not competitive sports. That's right. Mm -hmm. Right. You know, I I went to I observed a gym class in Denver when I was at a national school board conference, and through a grant, 
every single student got a Fitbit or something like a Fitbit. And when they went to the gym class, they knew their number. Nobody else knew their number. And their number was up on the chart. Mm -hmm. And they could see their heart rate. They could see how many minutes they ran. They could see what's, what the estimated blood yep. pressure would be. They yep. learned about their body. And it wasn't competitive sports. Right. That's what edu physical education right. is all about. Yep. Right. Right. That's awesome. Absolutely. Yeah. That's, what I, that's what I do. <laughs> that's what, I like that. And that's a mo that's a mo <laughs> Intrinsically, they can see what's and that's happening. A mo right, and you're, 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 com you're competing and you're that. working with your own you're personal goals. With your own, you're, first of all, you're learning what's important. Yep, yeah. absolutely. You, uh, first and foremost, you're learning what's important. And I think that those students who don't like physical education class, it's for the reason that you said before, the competitive piece. Yeah. They're not the athletes that are going to rise to the top and play basketball well. But when you're working on your own physical health, mm -hmm. you can mm -hmm. buy into that with, in a non-intimidating way. Right? And that's where we need to get. Well, that's the state of the art in PE, I yeah. believe. Right. Yeah. Well, if we can link that together yep. with health, I mean, we're really yep. going to be ahead of the curve here. Mm -hmm. The other thing I want to say, and then, and then you can have the floor, is that what you can tell from us is this is a high priority mm. among this school committee. Mm. So, I'm, and I'm glad you guys are with us on that. No, and we appreciate that support. Yeah. 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 Absolutely. I just wanted to make note, I just jumped on the Second Step website really quickly. Yeah. And just for the, all the school committee members, there's a ton of information on here. Mm -hmm. And it's very easy to navigate. There's sample lessons. Yep. Um, there's we have all the online piece. Yeah, too. Boston Public Schools uses it. Yeah. Um, they even have a Brazilian program, mm -hmm. where we just talked about how big our Brazilian population is. So I think as a tool, in combined with what else, you know, it's been around for quite some time, and it's we're working yeah. on. But but there's there's a ton of information on here, and it's very easy to manipulate. So, so all of our we, we you know we bought the educational bundles. So for the a bundles while. come with all the online tools too. So yeah. it's not just the physical curriculum, but there's a lot of digital resources. Even it talks about funding that. and all that kind of stuff. So there's a lot of good yeah. stuff in here. Okay, well we look, go ahead, Ms. Badger. My other question is: so if we're talking about adding nurses and physical yeah. oh in yeah, utilizing yeah. nurses not a yeah okay. sorry adding <laughs> nurses into this program <laughs> not adding right. extra nurses yeah. <laughs> so using the their skills in a different way and right. using our pe staff in a yeah. different way does that mean and forgive me if i if this isn't even a thing do they have to get a cer like certification do they have to take sit and take the test for health educators no, the nur our nurses are nurse educators. They're okay. licensed through DESI. I didn't know if they needed the additional. Yeah. No, 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 no. I think, um, and also like with the health and phys ed, if a teacher is certified in phys ed, they can teach 25% out of their content yeah. area. So yes. like, like at the high schools, most of the phys ed teachers also teach health sections, oh, yeah. and they've gone to more options with the. Yep. They can take a yoga. They can take a class in using a Fitbit. They, they, there's options, and there's also a competitive sports option. But those are things, and I think the key to all this will be what you folks said: the structure and the staffing that supports it. And um, Chris has all the literature and pieces, but the biggest piece is the, the teachers buying into it as a support, but also giving them support. Because as you hear from like Mr. Harold, right. they're doing so much on the mm -hmm. academic front. To add one more thing to their plate is something that we do not want to do. So it's something that we're gonna look at kind of a tiered approach to implementation of staffing based on some of the staffing things I share when we reduce with the retirement. We, we're gonna be juggling some pieces because the school day is not increasing, if that makes sense. So we still have the same amount of minutes yeah. and the same amount of teacher contractual time and expectations and things like that. So I envision kind of a tiered approach to the staffing lens, but getting it so that it begins at this piece, you know, this many staff on, the, on my side of it where yeah. You know, um, the yep. program itself will be more Chris and the principals, okay. what it looks like. I think we thoroughly understand the balancing act mm -hmm. that has right. to take place here. Yeah. It's hard because we but need we believe it has to take Absolutely. place. Absolutely. Yep. Absolutely. As do we. It will. Yep. So uh, at future agendas, we'll Absolutely. talk more about this. Yeah, as it, and as more guys, detail on okay. that. To, to that point, Dr. Sorensen, I'm going to give Mary Connolly a call and invite her to come um, and just be here and, and just provide a perspective of what's happening in health education and also what the approach that we're taking. That'd be great. Yeah. Okay. Uh, retirements. Yes. Um, we have three retirements to report tonight. Um, Deborah Miller, who is an MSN teacher at Manomet Elementary after 30 years of service. Um, Susan Saccarato, um, an English language arts teacher, um, 30 years of service again, PCIS. And Wendy Civic, um, a graphic design and visual communication teacher from 24 years from Plymouth South High School. <coughs> On behalf of the Plymouth School Committee, we thank these individuals for their service and wish them a happy retirement.
Thank you both. Mr. Morgan, uh, correspondence. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chairman. There are two uh, correspondence this evening. A thank you letter from Tara w Wilmer related to the CCTE students that recently performed uh, plumbing work in her home. And also a thank you letter to um, Beth Israel Deaconess um, a hospital uh, from Allison Reardon, science coordinator for a recent field trip they organized and hosted for the biomed program. And the details are in electronic school board. Thank you very much. Anybody, any questions for Mr. Morgan on that, on those two letters? Okay, moving to job description. Yes. Oops. Um, too many pieces of paper. Um, yes, we have three job descriptions tonight. We're in the final stages of our clerical positions throughout the district. Uh, Mr. Pinto isn't here. I, as I always give him a thank you for being on my committee. <laughs> but um, I knew he had another meeting. Um, the first is the Technical Studies Financial Secretary, uh, which is a 200-day position. Um, this, again, needed a lot of updating. And um, this individual works very closely with Mr. Costin in all the different revolving accounts and things of that nature. Um, because money is coming in as well as purchasing equipment. Um, and so it really, another big piece is coordinating travel for our DECA kids at both of the high schools and Skills USA because they excel so much. So that's become a real big piece of it. Um, and working closely with the business office as well. But they're obviously a part of the building um, and things like that. But they're very involved in munis and budgeting and things of that nature. I'm working with Ms. Sylvia. Okay, any questions on this? If there aren't any, we'll take a motion to approve it. Ms. Burgess moves it. Is it second, Ms. Badger? Is there any question of the motion? Okay, we'll vote on this uh, technical studies financial secretary Moved position. It. I did. Mrs. Mrs. Ms. Badger, uh, second. Yeah, I'll give you one second, and I was not paying attention. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. We picked up a little. Pick, we picked the pace up a little bit here. Yes, you, you know. <laughs> 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 I talked fast. It's that time, yeah. And I'm missing my. Way on. So. Yeah. <laughs> okay, everybody voted for that one. Guidance secretary. Yes, um, this is obviously the individual in the guidance office. Um, they do work throughout the summer months because scheduling and things of that, um, a great deal goes on in the summer at the schools. Um, they work with the college fair. They work a lot with Sean Halpin's office. Um, but they've, they've had a whole new layer of learning the Navient system, which is how our kids apply to colleges and things of that nature. So um, the, the, uh, most of the components are the same for all of them, but there's a few different pieces based on what they do. But the, the Navient component, and because it's a whole transcript portion to that, and it's a great tracking device, so they really facilitate that as well. Uh, before we take a motion, I have one suggestion under performance responsibilities. Mm -hmm. Number seven, I'll strike that. Number six reads, possesses, processes transcript requests from students to colleges of choice. Yep. I was thinking that there are times when a transcript does not go to a college. Correct. Goes to so a job maybe sometimes. just processes transcripts. Yep. Mm. Yep. Okay. From students. <coughs> yep. Definitely. That's a great suggestion. Anything else good from committee good. members? All right. We'll take a motion with that change. Ms. Badger. Mm -hmm. Mr. Morgan. Oh. Margie. Yeah. Margie. Margie. Didn't you? Margie. Margie. Somebody yes. move the motion. She was. Please. She was. Oh, fast. She, she, was fast. Fast. she don't look over She was ready. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I was trying to get her to do it. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so Margie made the motion. I don't know. Mr. Shelby, second, second down. Just hit him. Next time, Margie. Uh, just punch him in the arm. We're group. just on an island. <laughs> All right, Shelly, uh, second. Let's take the vote, please. We have a motion, and I'll second it. I did. Margie made it. Did. Mr. Shelly, second it. That's why I'm being quiet. I want to give them equal opportunity. Yeah, I try to keep my arm down, but then when nobody why, does so, it. So I don't get in trouble. <laughs> I would, but nobody looks over here. And I was busy doing that. Be careful what you wish for. <laughs> <laughs> Waiting on one more vote. That's it. Everybody vote for that one. And now the, the last one. Um, yes, this is also in the technical studies vein. Um, this is the administrative assistant to Ms. Sylvia. Um, and this individual does a great deal in regards to vocational education. Um, for example, we need to, by law, we have to do a report for DESE each year, postgraduate study. She compiles that data. It's a cyclical process, um, very labor intensive, um, works on the technical studies advisory dinner, um, does so much. I've worked next to the individual <laughs> for many years. And um, they're, they're really involved in the personnel side. They help with scholarship night with all the vocational tool ships and things of that nature. Um, and is also the district-wide vehicle use. Um, so there's a lot of different pieces to this job as well. So tried to capture it all, but be general as well. So 
Okay, committee. Ms. Badger. I just have a little picky thing. That's okay. Um, like, we had to get a little blurry to me <laughs> after a couple of years. You thought you couldn't get through. Um, the, the performance responsibilities underneath yep. them, if we can just make sure that anything that's a complete sentence is a, has a period after oh, yeah, it. I Absolutely. Yeah. Yes. There's a lot of them. I almost didn't, but I, I just, Yeah, I see it yeah, right yeah, there. Yeah, yeah. Yep, I do. Okay. Yeah. No, I, I like it. it we look at them every yeah, day. Yeah, no, so. it's hard. No worries. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, is there a motion coming from my right? <laughs> move it. Really? I move. Mr. We present Shelley with the changes. <laughs> yes. Ms. Burgess is the second. <laughs> we'll take the vote. <laughs> okay, excellent. Thank you. Uh, fundraisers. Anything to report on fundraisers? Dr. Campbell? Um, just that the new fundraisers are highlighted in blue. Are those that are the new receipts are in yellow, and anything that's sort of past due is put in red, and everyone I like knows. The color coordinating. They're they're pretty good about, um, as you can see, they've been very responsive to getting that information in. And we have a lot of fundraising going on. Oh. Any questions, Mr. Badger? You were you were out sick the the meeting mm -hmm. that I was so excited about it, but I just wanted like to tell you that <laughs> it, I, it just because it just seems people are being so much more responsive yeah. than they have been in the past. So all your hard work is finally getting through. Uh -huh. I know it seems it, probably it, like it's yeah. not, but you can see it visually. <laughs> yeah, it's good. thank you for that. Anything else uh, under fundraisers? Okay, moving to reports and proposals from committee members. Ms. Hunt. Um, just a couple things. I, I, I didn't know, I didn't hear if Ruby mentioned it or not, but the Plymouth North cheerleading team has made the state championships, which is going to be held on Saturday or Sunday. And if they make it through that, they will hopefully be going to Myrtle Beach for the Nationals. So it's the closest they've gotten in a while. I think they did the States last year, but they have a really good chance of moving on this year. Um, the DVC meeting is going to be held after the meeting with the um, students. We've invited the Distinguished Visitors Committee to actually maybe if they can come to that meeting, they can meet some of the students. Um, I just want to give a, a plug for the March. I didn't. I kind of expected Mr. Cable to do it. The March 9th is doing a fundraiser for the VPA oh. at Mayflower Brewing Company. I know I have a ticket already. I was just talking about like, it this morning to me too. Yeah, so, it looks like yeah. a fun a fun night. It's a fundraiser for the VPA. It's um, Irish music and food and it'll be fun. Um, and then another plug. Jason had said it. I wanted to plug uh, next week's meeting on the sixth. It's going to be a regional meeting. Like full dinner is included free if anybody wants to come um, you're coming and uh, it's it's actually a really good opportunity on a more intimate level to get together with all the school committee members and administrators um, I know somebody from the Wareham School Committee that's going to be going um, and it's going to be to talk about what we talked about with the APC about the funding and I know I was unable to make that meeting so I'm really looking forward to having the discussion um, with that and then one more thing this Saturday and again if I if I missed it if Ruby said it Plymouth North High School Student Council is having a craft fair yep. Okay. Yep. so I just want to make sure that everybody stops by that because it sounds like they're gonna have a ton of vendors and mm -hmm. Great. that's yeah. it Ms. Badger. Um, since our last meeting, we had a Pilgrimary Collaborative meeting, and I know I talked to, I think, a few meetings ago about we were kind of playing with the idea of doing member and non-member rates. Um, after a lot of analysis, um, they've decided that there's going to be no change. Um, when, when we looked over the pricing structure, it just didn't make a whole lot of sense to do member versus non-member, and you really weren't getting a lot back so it will continue to stay that if the collaborative um, has more in the surplus then we'll get our percentage back that we've been getting in the past if not we won't get anything back but it it all works out to be basically the same and so that that was decided at our last meeting um, we've also um, just lost me um, the collaborative is looking good right now we're getting better towards the the amount of students we have versus the amount of um, uh, what we pro projected. So we're getting closer to breaking even, which is, is, is really good for the collaborative. Um, and there's some exciting news, hopefully, down um, 
down the line that we'll be able to share. Hopefully, we'll see what happens. That's it. <laughs> the teaser. Oh, and then um, I just wanted to just again thank the Plymouth Education Foundation for that wonderful gala, Miss oh, yeah, Hunt. That was fun. Dr. Myasis and I went, and it was a, just a really nice event. We danced. Yes, we did. We danced. <laughs> okay, we're on Someone. reports and proposals. Um, I just want to send out a kudos. I, I you know, we have we have athletes from north and south uh, at the arenas. Uh, in in um, what's the name of that arena again? Reggie. Reggie Lewis. Reggie Lewis. Oh, yeah, Reggie Lewis. Lewis. Yeah. Yeah. Name Reggie on that Lewis. list. Yeah, but forget that part. Champions. I was very oh, impressed. Oh, yeah. <laughs> we had. We had maybe a total of one girl, three boys, maybe four athletes, but every single track coach took their Saturday and went to support those. That's there great. were more coaches than kids. Aww. Kudos to those coaches for giving up their Saturday. I, I'm really impressed with that. I, was, I have a soft spot for the track kids because Reggie is a thankless winter season that, uh. you know, the, the basketball teams, football, they all get – but you drive up there, and I would always go once a season at least, and to see that oh, arena and how it works, and too, they have yeah. incredible success. It's incredible. It's yeah. incredible. Yeah, it it's really incredible, is. and they, the kids deserve a lot of kudos yeah, too. Yeah. So it's impressive. Yeah. <laughs> okay, PYDC, is there a report this yeah. evening? Uh, yeah, I'm. I was unable to go because I was <laughs> in the hospital at the time, uh, but um, but we did get the uh, thing, and I'll just hit some highlights of of what came out on the report. And uh, they did some updates on if they had known. Um, they had a live question and answer session at uh, Plymouth uh, North High School after they had seen that film. I'd been to that one. And um, the uh, seventh grade health classes, uh, training around the, uh, the science of addiction and uh, the adolescent brain. And um, the photo voice project is almost completed. And those are wonderful. Those, mm -hmm. yeah, they, they really tell a story, the photo voices. And um, high school uh, guidance and nurse uh, professional development, uh, they're working with that. Uh, vaping, Dan Riley and the EdTV are working to create a PSA about vaping and e-cigarette use. Um, so, uh, the photo voice showcase, again, has been shown um, at the B&G Club, and uh, it was broadcast on PAC TV. Um, let's see, trades training. Yeah, they have trades training because they found that they, they found that a lot that a high percentage of tradespeople uh, mm -hmm. are becoming addicted. Mm -hmm. Yeah, more than any other profession. And um, so there's uh, upcoming meetings on cannabis and uh, legislative breakfast. Uh, the uh, interface, I'll, I'll, I'm going to bring up interface because uh, it's, I think it's been before, but I think it's something that the public should know about. And that's uh, Plymouth has purchased interface referral services, which is a service through the William James College that attempts to break down the barriers to individuals gaining access to outpatient mental health services. And their helpline that operates Monday through Friday from 9 to 5 connects callers with a resource and referral counselor who will help them navigate the challenges of finding outpatient mental health services. And um, so people have had a lot of trouble with uh, making appointments, you know, scheduling insurance issues. So if you want to use the service and you're a Plymouth resident, it, the number is 888 Two four four six eight four three, and um, a twenty-five thousand dollar behavioral health grant was awarded through the Chena to fund this service in Plymouth. So, and I got to tell you, it works because I always have two or three messages on my machine oh, good. to faith yeah. looking mm. to refer yeah. kids into we're, practice we're oh. and doing their job. Yeah, That's yeah we're awesome. thrilled and to I have, have a that. Building committee report. Ms. Badger. I just, I'm just wondering, so under the mini training brainstorms, and it says mm -hmm. current mini trainings, and they're attached, is there, can we get those sent to us? Uh, um, yes. It, it, we've, set, we've given some in the past when Kelly yeah. came, but we can get all these yeah, attachments you can see. Yeah, I just think that they yeah, we've, would uh, be they're like in a, um, She's done like a five by seven, and she, she'll educate them at the meeting, but it's oh, a nice okay. little yeah, visual like, yeah, canvas style. Them. Yeah, we've uh, Illustration. Yeah, she yeah. does a really great, nice job. What she's done with the interface um, 
for marketing purposes too. The, so. uh, the other thing I was wondering is if sometimes, um, even if it's once a month, you know that they do the mini series for us. Yep. But the mini series doesn't last that long. And can we do it at school committee so that the public also takes advantage of the mini series? I think it's important that uh, that the public is aware of what's going on uh, uh, with certain substances. Uh, being, we can consider that. Yeah. Good idea. <clears throat> The agenda doesn't show it, but there should be a building committee report now. Yes, and um, so the building committee met this uh, past Thursday, and uh, of course we've we don't have South High School on it any longer. <laughs> <laughs> it seems to have been removed. That's good, and so we're onto the Russell Street parking deck. Uh, the parking deck uh, bottom has opened, and uh, town employees are using that. They're going to finish the top of the deck. Um, uh, once the weather gets good and once they do the employees will park up there and public parking will be paid parking down in the garage um, then the library um, roof chiller and skylights they are working on getting all that done because they've got a lot of leaks still um, maritime facility um, <clears throat> they're going to town meeting in April for th three to five million um, they have, uh, they don't want to lose the one million they, seaport grant that they have. And, um, but anyway, they've got everything all ready to go know, on that uh, maritime facility. North Plymouth Fire Station, um, the bids uh, will be in on uh, March 21st. Um, <coughs> and uh, what is it saying about the property? For diesel, there's, some, there's some, something came in the bidding process. They don't know if they'll have to go back out to bid or not because um, on it they put the wrong name with the right thing that they wanted. So two companies that are competitors, um, it could cause a big problem. Okay. So they might have to just pull it and, and redo it. And that'll hold stall, stall the uh, North Plymouth Fire Station from moving forward. Uh, 1749 Courthouse. Uh, they are really working, and I know they're going to town meeting uh, for money from CPA funding uh, for various things because they're doing the um, the church at the head of the square, and they're reshoring it up and all. So they're redoing the courthouse to the left, the 1749. They're also going to do the roadway, and they're going to improve town square is what's what's uh, happening with that, and. Um, so that's coming up. Um, other project updates. Um, no, I'm, it's, not, it's not really too important. Um, it'll be 160, but on for town meeting, they're asking $160,000 for the resurfacing of Town Square. And the Mayflower Society officially took over that stone church at the head of the square last Thursday. So that's done. And um, so I'm trying to find it. I guess that's okay. th that's enough. Thank you very much okay. for that report. Yeah. Uh, personnel. Um, yes. We have three um, coach and advisor appointments, two classified appointments, um, two short-term maternity leaves, and four resignations. All right. Thank you. Uh, home and school? Yes, tonight we have two home school plans that have been reviewed by Dr. Halpin's office, and they meet all the requirements set forth by the Plymouth School Committee, and I recommend approval of these two additional plans. Okay, questions or motion? Ms. Badger? I move that we approve the two home school plans as presented. Thank you. Is there a second? M Mr. Morgan is the second. Question to that? Okay, we'll take the vote, please. Okay, that's great. Everybody voted in favor of that one. Uh, accounts payable, please. Ms. Hunt. <clears throat> Whereas school committee members have been provided with a copy of the cost center transact transfer and transaction summary report and the warrant review, I, rem I move that the Plymouth School Committee accept and approve the report and accounts payable warrant number S021419 dated February 14, 2019 in the amount of $1,295,469.60 as presented. That's the motion. Is there a second? 
Ms. Ms. Burgess is the second. Is there a question to that? Okay. Can we vote on that, please? Is that, that's unanimous. Thank you. And then there's another warrant, please. Sorry, I'm just waiting for it to go over. <clears throat> Whereas school committee members have been provided with a copy of the cost center transfer and transaction summary report and the warrant I re <coughs> for review, I move that the Plymouth School Committee accept and approve the report and accounts payable warrant number S02-2819, dated February 28th, 2019, in the amount of $913,291.29 as presented. Okay, that's the motion. Is there a second? Ms. Badger is the second. Is there a question? Okay, we'll vote, please. <clears throat> Everybody voted in favor. Thank you. We have minutes. January 7th, 2019. What's the pleasure of the committee? Ms. Badger. I have. So, sorry, it's taking longer than I thought to open. Um, it, we have under executive session 1.2, it says, Massachusetts General Law Chapter 30A, Section 21A, X, which I assume is supposed to be 10, but I don't think that's the right section. But I don't know. You, know, you don't know what it is? I don't know for a fact, but I read it up and I didn't think that 10 was the appropriate. I thought it said something about electrical matters or something, not electrical, but like that. So I wasn't sure it was the correct one. And I didn't want to assume what was supposed to be. Um, and then just at the end of the committee reports, after what I, when I speak, there's a zero or a, a, a no. I'm not really sure. It just needs to be deleted. Where are you? What page do you know? Um, the committee, I didn't. Page uh, six. Page six. Well, it's at the end, so it's actually on page seven, right? Six. And it's uh, just under A, committee reports, 8.1, where I speak, and then there's just an O or zero. I'm not really clear. Yeah. It just needs to come up. Unless. Oh, I see right here. Yeah, yeah, okay. Do you see those changes too, Peg? I don't have any, I don't have any called up. All right. I'm not comfortable having any clue if you think that I have any clue. Well, no, it, it's just that on page six, it should say 8.1 when it says 8.2. Is that, no, is that right? No. No, no. 8.1, after my, like, um, report, there's just a zero at the end of it. It just says oh, yeah, yeah. dot zero. Yeah. Yeah. Just, and I just my question was I didn't think that 10 was the appropriate one but I could be wrong when I was reading it I was like because I googled it and I was like that doesn't that sound right but maybe it is it might be I, don't know. I think it's been there forever okay 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 and we'll hold it off to another meeting yeah perfect okay it might be right, and I just am causing more than I need to, but. <laughs> okay, so the next, the next minutes on our agenda is minutes of January the 7th executive session, but I was not able earlier today to access those minutes. Oh, I did. Oh, I could. And I, I, I really looked thoroughly, and I couldn't get to them. Oh, here we go. Yeah, they do. Can you access them? So now? that's the section. Uh, so I'll abstain. If everybody, else ha if everybody else has read them and they want to approve them. Everyone else is able to access them? That's no the question. executive session minutes or the yeah. regular January executive session? Executive session. Okay, right. yes. And that's the same day? So I yeah, but when you click on them, it says regular minutes. So you're going to well, here. Because I referenced no, you didn't actually. It's yeah. just talking about It's you. different. It's different? Yeah, so this is, uh, sec it's sorry, I talked out of turn. <laughs> 21A3. And he mentioned the unanticipated so. safety issue. Right. 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 Yeah. Okay, is that already further stated? We can probably go back and return to the regular meeting session and their property committee. Oh, I see what you mean. Okay, they're in the regular meeting. Gotcha. Yeah, gotcha. Yeah, All right. Okay. I did, I did read them then. Ms. Badger. So I think, and I don't know if it's possible, but we could go back because this one has uh, Mass General Law Chapter 30A, Section 21A3. So this might be the appropriate one, and the X was like a space holder. What? Oh, I see. What you're what? The recommendation. Oh, yeah. I see what you're saying. Yeah. I just yeah. lo I just looked it up on the MGL and and ten is right. Reference tw the um, twenty one A three is correct. Okay. Okay. Well, I'll put that on the okay. regular meeting minutes. Yeah. So can we go back? Well, 
Yeah, that would, then we won't have to bring them up again. Yeah. So let's go yeah. back. Yeah, let's, let's, go, let's, let's start again. A minute for January the 7th. Do I have a motion with the amendments, Ms. Badger? I move that we approve the minutes of January 7th with the amended, uh, the edits. Okay. Mm -hmm. Is there a second to that? Ms. Burgess is the second. Are there any other questions on that? Okay, we'll take the vote on, on the minutes of January 7th. Here we go. Open session. I haven't, I haven't got it on my thing. Scroll up and then click. No, yeah, yeah, I got it. It's okay. Got it. Okay, everybody voted for that. Now we can do the minutes of January 7th executive session. Do I have a motion? Ms. Badger. <laughs> I move that we approve the executive session minutes of January 7th. Seconded by? I'll second it. Mr. Morgan, sure. thank you very much. Uh, any questions? All those in favor? I mean, we have to vote. <laughs> <laughs> that's okay. It's that's still be in a Everybody <laughs> voted anyway. That's good. Okay, now we have the minutes of January the 8th, the joint budget meeting. Do I have a motion? Oh, January. Just double checking because it was one that had a little typo, but I don't think it's this one. It's the next one. It's the next one. You know think, what I'm talking about? I think I do. Right in the beginning? Oh, yeah. I think you're right. I think, I think. It's the next one. Let me look. He's glad. I didn't write it down. Yeah, it's not this one. Wow, a lot of crap in here. <laughs> 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 yeah, okay. I'll, I'll move it. Uh, Miss Burgess moves it. You're a godsend, I'll tell you. <laughs> Is there I a didn't second? want to do three in a row. Second. Okay, we got a second from Miss Hunt. Are there any questions on this joint budget meeting? Minutes. Okay. And we'll vote. Oh, gosh. Okay, great. There. Moving right here along. The 28th of January. Minutes, okay. Miss Badger. So I wasn't really good. I was on the plane reading this, so my notes are really poor. Um, where I was talking about waitress, so let's find where that was. Um, <laughs> sorry. Um, if I could find it. It's on uh, it was early. the third page. Third page, thank you. Um, it said something about me being concerned of the title in the content. I was, I was a little concerned about the content because the title didn't reflect. That's what she's talking about, right? Um, Which one? But basically, I was just concerned about the content of this performance. The title I don't, wasn't really necessary. Because it says Miss Badger shared that she loves the theater, but she is a little concerned about the title and content of this performance. So just the content of the performance. Just remove the word. Title and. Title right. and, okay. Um, and then there's an 8.0. I'll get there. Um, Um, the my comment was it says Miss Badger wanted to take a moment to compliment the new reporting process on the fundraising report that is much easier to read and interpret. Um, I also just made the same comments I made today. Basically, the fundraising report is is the process is being followed. So that's not exactly the um, the essence of what I said. So when I I would just like it to read Miss Badger wanted to take a moment to compliment the new process on the fundraising report that. Um, seems to be is being followed better than in the past. Is I can't think of words at this point, but it's. I didn't. I don't think I said much easier to read and interpret. I think it was that people were actually following the rules, the or the rules, the which is what regulations. Yeah. Which is what yeah. I said tonight. So I just wanted to clear that up, and that's it. That's all I have to say. Mm. <laughs> After ten <laughs> years. <laughs> Sorry. Okay. With those two changes, do we have a motion? You gonna move it? I can. <laughs> I move February. I mean I January. Ms. Burgess is the second, and we're now we're talking about this January the twenty eighth. Everybody's <laughs> time. It's time to vote. Come up yet? Yeah. There it goes. Great. We have one to go. 
the 28th executive, executive, executive session. session. Yeah, right. I must have missed it. Well, I had an edit, but I can't find it. <laughs> Michelle just moves. <laughs> Again, the plane, it just didn't work for me. <laughs> I'm Michelle. Mr. Selly is the second. The people on my right have come through again. On Friday? To Shelly. To Shelly. Okay, are uh, there any questions on this one? We're waiting. No. <sighs> my notes are terrible. Going once. I know. I had one little typo, but I can't. Oh my God! What I just did. What'd you just do? Oh what did God. you just do? Oh, you just did. <laughs> oh. We stayed at eleven. Turned the meeting too soon. Do you have anything, Miss Bur Miss Badger? I do, but I don't think it's critical because I can't find it. I wrote a note that makes sense, but. There was something about, oh, oh, I got it, sorry. <coughs> There's a part and it says at student, um, another student itself was had extreme behavior. We just need to remove was. Had extreme behavior. So it says another student at self <laughs> had extreme behavior, but I can't seem to find it. This is the executive notes. I found it oh. yesterday morning. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, found it. Okay, it's the it's on the second page. It's the last paragraph before the bold where we do the motion, and it's the first sentence. That's it. Okay, thank you for indulging me. Got that? <laughs> okay. Any other questions? Right. Did everybody vote? Every, yeah, we're going to vote right now. Oh, we're going to vote. Oh, okay. I already voted. I already voted. <laughs> <laughs> I thought it was open to vote. Yeah. I thought yeah. it was open to vote. It's just me. All oh, good. It's unanimous. We've All right. Been, yeah, Any other business to come before the school committee? No. Speak now. Whoever holds your peace. Nope, I'm good now. We stand adjourned. Thank you very much. <laughs>